Thank you. Yep, I see a little red light. So welcome to the Battery Park City Committee meeting um, for Manhattan Community Board 1. It's our December 1st, our December meeting, bringing the year to a close of 2021. Um, my name is Justine Kucha, and I'm the chair of this committee. My co-chair is Kathy Gupta. She is not with us today. She's traveling. Um, and I'd like to just introduce the members of my committee. So wave if you're on, on camera as they show up on my list here. Betty Kay. Bob Schneck, Eric Flores, Jeff Galloway, Jimmy Sung, and um, public member Robin Forrest. And I think that is all who is here now. Um, a couple of other members haven't maybe are going to be kind of signing in late or are unable to attend today, but that's fine. We have quorum. All right. Um, welcome. We've got a full packed agenda, and I believe first on our agenda is is the Tunnel to Towers post race debrief and discussion. So with that, I want to introduce um, our lovely friends from the Tunnel to Towers Foundation, uh, Susan Starr, Stephanie Witt, and Stephanie, you're with? I'm with Tina Del Reggion, so Thank you. our executive vice president. <laughs> it's, a, it's, hey. it's a tough name. <laughs> it's a tough name, so thank you for helping me with it. <laughs> Gina Dell, it's good. <laughs> All right, Gina Dell, I like it. I like it. Thank you so much. Um, and us. as I just welcome it um, from my comments of having participated in the race itself and having been involved with um, some of the activities the day before, the day after, um, what a great job as always. So thumbs up again. Thank you Thank for being you so a, a partner as usual. And I um, open it to you to give us what you're your experiences were, and then I'll open it up to the community, and then I will open it up to the, you know, to the board and then to the community. Sure. Well, first, I just want to thank you so much for your words. They mean the world to us. You have been an amazing partner. Um, you know, this event is the heart and soul of our foundation. Uh, this is retracing Stephen Siller's footsteps from the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel to the World Trade Center. It's how the foundation started. You know, 1,500 people ran that race the first year. 20 years later, you know, you have 35,000 people. It's amazing. It's a beautiful tribute to our military first responders. Everyone we lost 9-11. Everyone's still affected by 9-11. Um, just the families, everyone. And it really just, I, I, it doesn't lessen for me, no matter how many times we've done it. It is my favorite weekend of the year. It means everything to me. It means everything to our staff, the Southern family. And it's just a coming together. And there's resiliency and hope and strength. And I, I'm just... I, I can't say enough wonderful things. I thank you that you think it went amazingly. We tried. We want to be great partners, great neighbors. We want to, you know, be there to to support and honor our, like I said, our first responders, our military, and, and everyone. And uh, I just want to thank you for that. Uh, Susan, would you like to add anything? You're on mute, Susan. Susan, I think we can't hear you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's funny you're not muted but we don't hear you maybe it's because you're on a, um headphones no but you're not on headphones i don't know what it means <laughs> oh. <Loser? laughs> maybe she's saying she sent an e uh, something in the oh, chat maybe yeah, let's, in the chat let's see Oh, All copies. Whilst we're waiting to see if Susan can get in or not get in or speak, um, I just want to say thank you also for recognizing um, the community. Sorry, my dogs in the background, but it was something that was really important to to, the, to those of us who lived through 9/11, um, have returned and stayed through 9/11 um, on all sides of. You know, the World Trade Center site, there are people here who are still suffering in a different way, but we're all still suffering in some way or another. And it was really um, uh, heartwarming to be included into everything because we are really all one family with all this, right? That's 100%. Right. We couldn't agree more. It's necessary. Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, I don't see anything from Susan. Susan, you can't speak? No? She just texted me. She said, Could you hear me? I said, No. <laughs> I don't try to text during this, but I thought. Yeah, well, that makes sense. All right. Well, anybody on the community on the community board have anything they'd like to say or add? Just raise your hand or just unmute and speak. That's fine. 
Uh, I would just say I think it's a great event. Uh, I unfortunately was out of town that weekend this year, so I couldn't um, observe or participate. But I know it's a great event, um, and it's you know it's it's nice to remember what uh, what happened that day and uh, the bravery of certain people and and how the community and the and really the whole country came together in a way that uh, seems almost impossible to believe <laughs> these days. You know. Well said. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Anybody in the attendee list? I don't see any raised hands. Um, to raise your hand, you have to go to the little thing that has a picture of a smiley face where it says reactions. And then you can, um, let me see if I'm lying to you because I'm doing it. Yeah, and then on the top of it, you'll see smiley faces and then it says, then you can see a thing that says raise hand. Click that if you want to speak. If I don't see any hands being raised right now, I will, uh, and I don't, I will um, say thank you. Thank you all for, for coming, and um, we look forward to you all next year. And thank you again for the good works that you're doing, because you really are doing good works, too. That Keep us up, you know, within, give us information about how the city in Florida is being, or the city, the town, whatever it is, is being built and what you guys are doing. It's always nice to hear that. Oh, sure, absolutely. So, um, our Let Us Do Good Village, we're actually breaking ground on December 11th in Pasco mm -hmm. County. Um, an anonymous donor who has been an amazing supporter of ours for years uh, donated the land. It's about 75 acres. Um, you know, we've been in the process. We got we got rezoned and, you know, we're, we're engineering and we're, we're building roads and everything else. We're breaking ground on December 11th. Um, and it's, it's, it's a village for our program participants that we support. So, um, injured veterans and first responders, Gold Star families, small first responder families, and it's going to have a community center and an APA compliant mm -hmm. pool and playground and, you know, everything that you could want and need. And we hope it's a beautiful support system for the families to be together. You know, we, we've found through the years, you know, we have all these long time relationships with our program participants. They're part of our family. They come in for our run. They're coming in for the gala on Friday. You know, they're, they're with us all year through and through. And, you know, a lot of them become best friends and they're a support system for each other. We're a support system for them. So, you know, we're hoping to give them that in this community. Um, okay. We're and we're breaking ground for December 11th. That is so cool. Congratulations and good luck. And um, come back to us with information as to how, you know, how it's doing, how you're going to be picking people to stay, to, to be living there. With 75 sacreds, I'm assuming they're not apartment buildings. I'm assuming they're houses, right? It's Florida. Uh -huh. We're planning to do 100 homes. So wow. Smart homes mixed in with our, our gold star and fallen first responder homes, which, you know, are, are normal sized, you know, 1500 square foot. And then the smart homes are the specially adapted, you know, custom designed homes for the injured veterans and wheelchairs and everything. So that, yeah. that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, Justine. It's always great to talk to you all. We really appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Take care. Thank you guys. Bye. <laughs> Guys, Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you guys too. Thank you. Lucian, will you pull up the agenda? Okay. Um, I suggest, and sorry to do this to you guys, but I want, uh, I would like to, to, um, all right, well, let's do that. We'll keep it in order. I've been given a hard time for not being in order. I think that the prohibition of co-op conversions in Battery Park City might be um, more controversial because we, not because we don't necessarily agree with it, but because a lot of questions have been raised that I'm not sure we have the answers to. But um, that is one thing that uh, we were looking to talk about today. Um, and I had hoped to bring it to resolution. Um, at this point, um, I just would like to kind of give a background and then I will open it up to the community for my board and then the public to, to uh, weigh in. So what's going on at this point in time? Um, in Battery Park City to date, there have only been condominiums, no co-ops. However, um, uh, I think sometime last year, pre-COVID, the, the Battery Park City Authority put an informal moratorium on the approval of any condo conversions. and apparently that was not considered that it was possible to do a co-op conversion and nick excuse me if i'm not getting it right but at the end of the day they've said no to condos and there is one building that has before a change in the law that occurred 
that allows them to go forward uh, as they have with their offering plan. The Solaire in the North neighborhood, um, which I believe is at 20 River Terrace, excuse me. Um, the Solaire is, um, has filed their offering plan. It was as a co-op, it was approved by the Attorney General recently. And part of where we're going is, I don't think we can close, uh, I don't think we have much say, but I don't know to stop any kind of uh, activity going on at the Solaire at this point, because it's been approved. However, um, we would, our thought process was to prevent any future condo or co-op conversions um, with the basis being to preserve affordable housing. Um, so with that said, I open this up to the um, board to kind of weigh in on that because um, I'm gonna be a spoiler alert. Jeff Galloway and I were talking and one of the things that he had raised was um, great idea, protect affordable housing, but what are we actually protecting? Because is there number one, is there any affordable housing left in these, uh, I think there's 12 buildings, including the Hallmark that are, and including Gateway and the Hallmark. There are 12 rental buildings, according to the Battery Park City website. Um, mostly in the North neighborhood, but there's, I believe, 50 Battery Place and 70 Battery Place in the South neighborhoods, so there's just two in the South. Of that, I don't know what is left of affordable housing. I don't know what where we stand. So I'm gonna kick it off to Jeff now. Yeah, I, as Justine says, I, I raised that issue with her. I think it's sort of a kind of a even broader question of um, do we think uh, apartment ownership is a good, bad or neutral thing? Um, to be fostering. Um, and whatever the answer to that question is, do we care between co-ops and condos? Um, if there are protections in one and the co-op conversion is simply an attempt to circumvent protections, then that's something that we should reasonably be concerned about. But I don't know the answers to any of these questions. Um, and it's not obvious to me that uh, a rental building where you know maybe two bedroom apartments are going for six or seven thousand um, dollars, converting that to a co-op is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, if anything, it might be a good thing from a um, stabilization perspective because it kind of locks in the six thousand dollars so that it's not going to be twelve thousand uh, dollars, you know, four years from now. So I, I uh, in contrast, however, if there are buildings that have rent stabilized or rent protected units in them where the condo conversion or co-op conversion would result in the elimination of those affordable units that's something i think we should be concerned about but i don't know if that's the case um and so just a blanket no co-op um it just it struck me as we don't know enough we don't have enough information to know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing or a neutral thing so that, that was my point. Thanks, Jeff. Um, my comment back is, is that um, it, it's almost a fallacy to say that, well, uh, with the double digit increases in pilot and ground rent for not, not double digit on ground rent for every building, but for some it's, it's up there. Um, there's no, until reform is had, and that's a different conversation. But until reform is is had based on the ground rent and then the pilot, um, it's not affordable to own in Battery Park City either, um, and it's 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 exponentially getting worse every year. Um, so I don't. That is one comment to what you said. However, um, I open. Well, to, and just and as we discussed yeah. on that, if you're talking about an unrent regulated building, those same the expenses the will thing. simply pa be passed along in rent right. uh, to the tenants. Correct. Historically, though, and, and what I'm going to, and, and I think maybe what I was doing um, unknowingly was the fact that the Battery Park City Authority saw fit in, a, in an effort to preserve uh, affordable rental housing in Battery Park City to, to put a, like a moratorium on condo conversions. Whatever that rationale is, is what I would assume would have applied here. However, I very much appreciate being called out and, I, and it's good, called out on, well, why? 
<laughs> don't assume, uh, figure out what you're doing and why we're doing it before we, we do it. And that is a fair bet. And I, and I stand by that. So part of what I want to have today, and I'm going to limit it. I'd like to try to limit it to, to no more than, than 30 minutes. If that long. A conversation, and if, if we don't come to any kind of um, resol uh, you know, a conclusion, what, what I would like to walk away with is a list of questions that we want to find out, and whether that's going to be Lucian doing it, Nick helping us do it, um, anybody wants to volunteer to help get information to figure out the answers to the questions so that we could better and more clearly address this, situ this issue. And that said, I see that Jimmy has raised his hand, and I'm going to call on him first, and then Bob. So, Jimmy, go ahead, unmute yourself and go. Um, my question is, so, so right now, there's a moratorium for both co-op and condo conversion. No, only co there's a moratorium only on condo conversions, not co-op. The co-op is going through. We're asking what, what this was supposed to do is to say, we got the moratorium on condos. Let's also stop co-ops. Any reason why they're letting co-op through? They just, I mean, this is me now speaking. They didn't think it was anybody would go for a co-op, so they hadn't thought about it. So it's squeezed through, um, and they didn't say no. And so, so I don't have a good answer for you. I, um, I'm very troubled by that because um, I just got a feeling that um, in general, you look at the ugly history of New York City co-op, right? Yeah, it's, it's, just, it, it, it's a system that's set up to exclude. Yes, it's a system to set up to exclude, and in fact. A lot of um, condos, you know, try to run like a co-op. Mm -hmm. you know, my experience with the New York City condo board and co-op board, you might also live in, you know, 1950s, you know, Mississippi. It is so ugly. I mean, look at this is. I think we should look very close to this. Why is this co-op thing going through? I honestly think that co-op is about exclusion. Co-op is about preserving. Co-op is like apartheid. Interesting. So something's going on. We need to look into it. Yeah, very good point, Jimmy. Thank you for raising that. Um, you're right, because at the end of the day, I think what Jimmy is referring to is that in a co-op board, the, the board itself has a lot more um, authority to approve or disapprove someone being able to buy in, you know, to buy an apartment. They, they, can, they can say, oh, no, we don't like you because you're... Uh, and like you, you paint your fingernails green. I mean, they, they can, whatever, they can do whatever they want. Condos is a little bit more um, distanced. It's not regulated. I don't know if that regulated is the right word, but I hear where you're going and that's a really good point as well. Um, and I don't have the answers to those questions. So let's make a note of that, please. And that is one question we're gonna look into if that's okay. And, and again, no, uh, not, not slinging any mud here on anybody because we don't know what's going on. Justine, it's Nick Fordon. Good evening. Go ahead, Nick, and then yeah, I'll recognize you for quick. Yes, yes. I don't want to take away the deliberative time of the board, but just so we're clear for the conversation going forward on the difference between condo conversions and, yes, and co-op conversions. So we had announced in October of 2019, BJ Jones was our president and CEO, was at the Battery Park City Committee meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I think you were vice chair at the time. Yes. Um, and then the broadsheet, which we may be familiar with, wrote it up in the subsequent days. And he said then, he said, I want to be very clear, some of the potential condo conversions that are people that are concerned about, we've been very clear, and we are still of that position in mind. We've been very clear with developers over the last year, and then some about our position that we want to preserve the rental housing that exists in Battery Park City, and therefore we will not be approving any conversions to condominiums so because they require the BPCA's consent due to the ground lease. So the ground lease of these buildings say if you want to convert to a condominium requires the assent and the consent of the Battery Park City Authority. And we are saying we're not going to give you our consent to convert to condos. We've been crystal clear about that and, and consistent about that throughout and in keeping with that pledge there have been no condominium conversions in battery park city since that time that's um that was said in 2019 but at the time it had been two years it's now more than five years there have been no condo conversions 
in Battery Park City. That's because the authority has the ability to consent to them, and we have not lent our consent, and we will not be lending our consent. And right. It never even gets past. If you don't give your consent, it can't even get past you to go to the attorney general. Because it's in the ground lease that they have to get our yeah. consent. Now, Co-op conversions is a different animal. Yeah. What's Battery the deal? Park City Authority does not have approval rights over co-op conversions. So under its ground lease, the Solaire has the ability to convert to a co-op with the approval of an offering plan by the New York State Attorney General's office. Now, there was new legislation passed by the state in 2019 that created a stricter process through which buildings must proceed for co-op and condominium conversions. I'm not an attorney and it's not my law, so I don't want to go into the specifics, but there was a law, as I understand it, that made it a little more tighter to go through. Mm-hmm. Um, my understanding is the Solaire uh, and a, a second building, Tribeca Green in Battery Park City, had started the process of co-op conversions before that 2019 law went into effect. That so is my understanding, too. That is, that, um, yeah, that is accurate. They're not breaking any rules. So, all right. And, and they have, as of right, in their ground lease, they have the ability to do this without our assenting to it. The, okay. The, the, general, the attorney general has to do it. Okay. Um, nonetheless, where it can, the Battery Park City Authority is continuing to work to preserve uh, rental units. But that's the background. Uh, that's the background for the committee. So, where we have the ability to uh, give our consent for these things, we are not giving our consent. Where we don't, the law is the law. Okay. So, I hope that helps. Thank you. That does actually help. I mean, and that was helpful, Jimmy, to get some background. Yes. You're on. You're on mute. Unmute yourself. Now you're on mute. You're on mute. Unmute. <laughs> um, so why is the why is a why is a co-op allowed and condos not allowed in Barry Park? So what what Nick just said was that and and I don't have what I heard Nick what I heard you say and then maybe you can weigh in a little bit on this. The Barry Park City Authority back in 2019 said they were stopping the they were not allowing um, any at this point in time for a foreseeable future not going forward with condo conversions because they wanted to preserve the stock of rentals, rental buildings in Battery Park City. I did not hear Nick say affordable rental or not affordable. He was just, he was not. Um, well, but he was, also said they had the authority under their ground lease yes, and to do that, and they don't have the authority under their ground lease to well, do the that con- with respect co-op to co-ops. Converts. So that's, that's the distinction here with, with where where we as a, as our community board here in the Battery Park City Committee can ask the, we can ask anybody to do anything, but we would have the authority to ask the, we would have um, a little bit more clout, I suppose, asking the Battery Park City Authority to continue its moratorium on condo conversions. They have less power, well, they have no power is what I'm hearing you say, Nick, as it stands today, unless there's a change in the ground lease between the Battery Park City Authority and the rental buildings that exist to um, to prohibit any con- co-op conversion because they just skip you. Even if you say don't do it, they just go around you. So any reason why back then they allowed this exception to the co-op? Like why did they make that distinction back then? These are very sophisticated people. They don't make rules for no reason. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Question, I don't know. This was back in the eighties, right? When these when these ground rents were, were written, correct? Let Nick. I mean, I think this is all old stuff. I mean, it would date back to whatever the ground lease is from uh, from each building. So um, I, I will admit I'm not anywhere near enough an expert in housing to understand whatever the specific vagaries may be between co-ops and condos and why some things are allowed. But it's not specific to Battery Park City, uh, as far as I understand. I mean, buildings, as I understand it, generally, I don't want to speak for every building. But in the main, buildings can go co-op. Well, so, all right. So that just thing, if, if affordable housing and diversity is what we're concerned about, <laughs> you have a problem. <laughs> I think so. Yes, exactly right. Which is what, and, and I'm loving the fact that this is, that you brought us right to that point, because we're supposed to have that as a forefront of our, in our minds as we're going forward with resolutions and conversations, diversity, inclusion, and, and equity. And yeah. so you brought it right to the forefront. I, I so thank so. you for that. And also thank you for, um, Nick, to point that out. I think that to, yeah. to make progress, we need to make some new laws. Yes. I, th- I think that's, yeah. I, I think, Otherwise, I you're going to, 
this is going to be co-op city, and、uh, it's going to be it's gonna much, be much more exclusive. Much, much more exclusive. Yeah, it will be much more exclusive. But we're going that way on so many levels, Jimmy. But yes, you're correct.、Um, so one thing I believe, so, so I don't know that I'm ready yet because I do have questions. I don't know if I'm ready to put this forth to a resolution.、Um, so Lucian and I had talked about some stuff and put some pen to paper. Jeff, I have not had a chance to look at what your suggestions were.、Uh, no,、um, I don't have anything detailed on this one. Other on this, we need okay. To discuss. Yes. Okay.、Um, so I, I don't have specifics. I think that in it, so Justine, are you、ask. moving? I'm、forward? not going to call on you. Don't worry, I'm coming、oh, okay. to you, Bob. I'm finishing、okay. my pontification, then I'm calling on you. Sorry.、Um, but yeah. So in the, in a, in the resolution, as I foresee it, is number one. Our focus, my focus, was diversity, inclusion, and affordability preservation. As much as possible in Battery Park City, and how we accomplish that, and if we accomplish that by making a prohibition on con, on co-op conversions, that we I want an answer to that question. What are we preserving? How are we doing it? But then you raise a whole nother level of concern, because as you say, co-ops can be exclusionary in a way that condos and rental buildings cannot.、Um, that said. When after the after the meeting, I will share the the, the research that Lucian had had put together.、Um, there, he references the law that Nick spoke to about a change where there's some percentages of、uh, I'm not sure what it is, but there's some percentages of something that's allegedly trying to address some of the inequities in、uh, I don't know if it's co-ops and condos or just co-ops, but there was something there. And then third,、um, you're correct. We need to. We need to, in our resolution, I think, look to calling on the Battery Park City Authority as the ground leases come up for each of these twelve rental buildings, to think about putting a prohibition for for、um, or at least putting in a requirement that even for co-op conversions they have to ask for, they have to go through the Battery Park City Authority. Just like you've got the ability to say yes or no to a condo, you should have the ability to say yes or no to a co-op. But again. That's a discussion that we can keep having, and, and we、we'll, and we will look forward to going forward in the next in the resolution when we when we do it. But I want to keep those in our minds and put that on the record. Bob, I'm shutting up now. You go. Thank you.、Uh, what I wanted to say, firstly, is I completely agree with Jimmy. I want to applaud that position. I think that it's true uh, that uh, that. Co-ops are much more difficult to deal with, both from the point of view of someone who's an owner and the point of view of a renter. So I just wanted to comment, just from my point of view, this is the difference between a community board committee and, for example, a legislator is they actually have a research team, and there's so much of this we don't know. So I just had an experience where I learned that. The the basic cost structure of this community is so high that even if a if a little private owner owns owns it a hundred percent, and even if you charge what I would have considered to be、uh, almost abusive levels of rent to people, it's still it's still both way too expensive for the renters, and it's also economically unfeasible unfeasible for the owners. So what happens here is a thing that I would like to research: is is that tr- is that true that the cost structure for owning property in Battery Park City and the cost structure for renting here is really extraordinarily high? I noticed that、um, that Tribeca is the eighth most expensive place to live in the city of New York, and and that Battery Park City or that their second. And we're eighth, and so being eighth, that might mean that our expenses here, when you add the taxes、um, plus the 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 running fees from Battery Park City Authority that we have in the pilot, it could it could be that those are so high that they preclude reasonable rent and they preclude the possibility of affordable housing under any condition without massive subsidies. So what I would like to have happen is to get some research whether or not that principle is right that we are so high that we can actually in in a resolution or somewhere begin to ask the question about cost structure. The other thing has to do with the community structure, and that is that we have 
very ex a very expensive uh, retail ecosystem and a very expensive restaurant ecosystem. And we don't have any simple low cost kinds of options here at all. And we'd rather put something like pick a bagel out of business for three or four years and have an empty shell than try and have something there that actually serves the community. So another aspect of a possible resolution is restructuring the community in some way that the businesses here actually reflect and address some of the needs. And then that's related to the question, how can we tell what people really want here? So can we have, is there some kind of survey that asks the question, how livable is this for you in terms of, you know, in terms of, you know, the retail situation, in terms of the restaurant situation, are you comfortable here? Can you sustain here? Because some of my very good friends in Battery Park City are leaving Battery Park City because they can't afford the, the, they can't afford to own here, they can't afford to rent here, and they can't afford to live here. So th that's a pretty serious condemnation for something that's one of the finest planned communities in the city of New York. So that's my question and comment. No, that's great, Bob. Thank you very much. Um, I would hope that we have people in the community, but I I'm not knowing that anybody's raising their hand, but people in the attendee section um, who might want to speak as to what their experience is, if any, as a renter in Battery Park City. Maybe um, Eric or Jimmy, you can speak to that. I'm not even sure if you could or want to, but I think it is very expensive. I think that, you know, one of the biggest battles I feel that is facing us as a Battery Park City Committee is affordability on so many levels. Um, and I do think it's our mantle to pick up and to fight for, um, but I'd like to hear from Eric, you, you unmuted, speak. Yeah, um, I actually have a friend uh, who was just told recently that um, his owner, who he's running from, is selling the property, and he has to be out by February first, which is in two months. He has a baby due in June. They have a very nice two bedroom. They pay a lot of money, and they're looking around now for something equal to that, and. I attribute it to the COVID because prices were very, very low and now they're very, very high. And yeah. he's like, I don't know how I'm, I'm going to afford this. I, I've been living here for, I think they've been here for about five, six years now, seven years. And everything is one and a half times what he's looking for, he, who's paying right now. And same yeah. for me, I, I grabbed something right at the end of um, the pandemic right before it shot up. But if I were to move today, I would have to leave. I just I couldn't afford it. Yeah, I totally get that. Um, yes, um, and I think this is going to be a recurring theme because, um, as the world started to open up after COVID this summer, meeting people um, on the Esplanade just in different things, whether it was the Esplanade volleyball group or um, the 9/11 celebration that Gateway Plaza and the Battery Park City Authority hosted, but meeting new people that were here and had come in and had just moved here, whether it was in Gateway Plaza or renters in different buildings, they were all, they all came because the rents were cheaper and they are all terrified that they're going to have to leave because they've fallen in love with living here. And um, they're, they're out, they're priced out. And I find that so, I find that unconscionable. Forget that it's sad, it infuriates me because people Even should leave because they want to, not because they're forced out. I came from Liberty View across uh, literally across the street from where I'm at right now. And they were offering three months for us to stay like well, yeah. three months for us uh, for to stay during like probably the last couple of months of the pandemic when we were on shutdown. And now they're far over what I was paying there. They've shot their prices up incredibly high and the, to the point where I, I love that building. I, I didn't really want to leave, but you know, children, I kind of had to. And yeah. uh, I couldn't go back. There's no way for me to go back to to rent the apartment I had already been renting, which they were going to give me three months for. Yes. Yeah. Totally get it. Um, because part of the part of the um, uh, any of our legislative officials that are listening to this right now, part of the um, dilemma 
or the loophole in the law that makes no sense to me is that preferential rent nonsense and being able to say your rent is five thousand dollars a month but we'll give you three three months off which means my rent is not five thousand dollars a month somebody right. did the math for me but it's it's way less but when you come up for renewal they're going to charge you that five thousand plus whatever percentage increase they want to charge you and for you your pocketbook is saying wait that's like a thousand dollars of an increase yeah and and it's perfectly legal that needs to be changed legislatively not 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 for our committee but um could i make a comment yeah following on to eric yes One of follow the things, on. eric i've noticed um is that i don't think this has to do with with uh, our experience and in, in your experience in uh, COVID, I don't think, I think on looking at the whole city, we're really fortunate. And if you happen to be an owner here or, or like a developer style owner, like Milford or something, then they just take absolute advantage because they have the financial means and the kind of positioning to do that. I think that the a thing to research here is what kinds of advantages developers and big time owners have over small time owners and what kind of advantage and leverage do they have over the renters and i think that the 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 developers and big time owners in battery park city have incredible advantages here and just can buy it and that the the thing that i also think you can base the research in is that battery park city was envisioned in the beginning as a gated community and it was envisioned in such a way as normal people wouldn't even be able there were bridges over between the buildings so that the normal people would be absolutely excluded which is a dream that jimmy sung didn't even have it just was an absolute vision of exclusion and then the insult that we take our money that we pay into this and we send it out for affordable housing somewhere else. That's the most astoundingly unbelievable. That's one of the many unbelievable things there are in the covenant beyond even the fact that I signed up to have my ownership forfeited in 2069. Both yeah. of those two things are horrifying. And so I think all this needs to kind of come to a head because, uh, because World Trade Center 5, the leasehold problem and this preserving rental problem, all of them are one thing, and that is the rules under which this was all created are so, so kind of pointing in directions that aren't logical, whether they made sense for someone and whether they were there just because someone made a lot of money. Whatever they are, we have to change them now because they don't make any sense in a very general way. So we almost need the equivalent of a Battery Park City Constitutional invent, uh, Convention, in, in my opinion. I love it. I love it. Remember democracy for BPC? <laughs> just like it. Jimmy, go ahead. Um, so I, I'll just, you know, definitely need more numbers, but just a snapshot, right? I believe Eric is attorney, correct? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a physician. Both of us are worried about paying rent in Battery Park. Just yes. imagine. Just imagine, yeah. I mean, just what's going on here, right? And this is on a piece of government land. This land actually belongs to. This. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not like a new attorney. I've been doing no, this. No, but, but I'm just telling you. Years now. Yeah, but, no, no, it, it, Eric, it, it, Eric, it, it, I'm just, yes. right? Yeah, no, but, but that's yeah. what I'm saying. Like, I'm, I'm not a right out of law school. Yeah, no, no, you are, yes. That, we are going to a place where people who are middle class or upper middle class cannot live here. And that is the crime of. And now, of what happened? This is on a piece of government land, unlike any other part of Manhattan. And now, if these built building turn into co-op, actually, Eric, we should be thankful we're still able to rent right now. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, there you go. But no, I appreciate this. All right, I think that we still, as much as I would love to bring this to a resolution, I think I still want some answers. So I want to bump this to a resolution for January. But I would like us to try to see if we can get some answers to some of these questions. And uh, Betty, you have your hand raised. I, I will say you're the last person to speak on this topic. And please go. Yes, while you're gathering some information, because I agree, this is absolutely not ready to be voted on. Uh, my question is, I remember Matt writing an article years ago 
but living in the north side, a lot of the buildings that you're talking about going condo well, were going condo when I bought. Yes. Uh, it was because of the 2008 financial crisis and the lack of uh, mortgages that they were forced in their minds mm -hmm. financially to move towards rentals, but they were never intended to be rentals long term. So I don't know how much we've really no, lost. Just leave it. But back to the way. article, I want to talk about they, they were 421A was the program that was used to create this so-called affordable housing. But in fact, when it was written up, and you can go back to one of Matt's articles in the broadsheet, uh, there were very few units. Although the great breaks that they got on their ground leases they were pushed off on people like me who were struggling after being a physical therapist to support where they live, who's retired and disabled, I'm subsidizing them. But yep. then it turns out very few of these subsidized apartments, they got people with high enough rents, they didn't qualify. Those that yep. didn't qualify were getting $5 a month break on their rents. So I don't want to sound too heroic with this affordable housing being saved, because in fact, they're putting a huge crunch on other people by taking a big feedback on the ground rent from the authority the thing gets pushed off onto the other buildings to give very small, it's, it's the developers that are winning and the building owners. Thank you. That is exactly right, Betty. And I think part of the deal with it needs to be as we're looking at this in a holistic approach is to, oh gosh, am I so What are the numbers? Is curtail, yeah, is to curtail the, um, if the landlord gets a break on the ground rent, that has to get passed on to all the renters, not just some, because you're right. The people who are paying market price are subsidizing the people who are paying or getting the subsidy to some degree, however it's worked out. And that's not supposed to be the case. The subsidy for the people who are not paying market value, market rate was supposed to be the tax break. And that's not what happened. Well, I, that isn't exactly my point, because I think the whole model in New York City is those who have subsidized the others. And it's difficult in Battery Park City because it's neighbor against neighbor. Uh, you know, if someone subsidized, it's like, I'm paying more to, so that you can pay less. Uh, and but then I find out they the did case. the same thing I did for a living. And it's like, really, it's a but, choice that's living. but what I was saying is that the, the amount of money that they're getting as a break from the authority that should be justified as being passed on. Correct. That's what I mean. Yeah. I agree. Not profit, you. not necessarily to everybody, but, but passed on to building occupants. Agree. Yes, passed on to the building documents. I agree with you 100%. That was what's supposed to was happening with Gateway Plaza, right? And it's gotten whittled down and whittled down and whittled down. But let's not go there. But that that was part of the deal. They got for lesser ground rent. They were giving stabilization, and then that got whittled smaller, smaller, smaller. The group. But um, but yes, those that, those are contract negotiations, and I think that that we do need to get involved, and we need to be more more proactive. And I think it does matter. Um. I want to move on because we've other things to talk about, and we're going to talk about this again. Jimmy, if you have, do you have anything to say about this? Your hand is raised. You're good or no? Okay, you're good. All right. So I would like to close this part down. I don't see anybody in the attendee list saying anything at this moment in time. Um, what I would like to do, sorry, I've got noise in the background. What I would like to do is at this point in time, um, I've lost my train of thought, so I'm going to forget that and come to it. So the next um, topic, which is request for legislation to create a major resident majority on the Battery Park City Authority Board of Directors. So, um, Betty, your hand is raised. I don't know if it's still raised, but you can like lower it and raise it again if you want to get called on this time around. Um, on this solution, can you pull up the resolution that we kind of put together, and then I'll give people a chance as I'm kind of saying why I think this is important. Give people a chance to look at it and give the, the, the committee and the people in the in the in the uh absolutely and and also i just also want to say that um cb1 is now posting draft resolutions uh on two different websites uh, one is if you go to our main page and click on uh, meetings where we post our uh, full agendas uh, there's a link to draft resolutions and then also on the live meetings portal, um, just under like the name of the committee, there's another link to draft resolution. So for those of you uh, joining us at home, if you uh, if you you know can't read what I have on my screen share, um, 
maybe that will be easier. It's a PDF. You can download it, uh, print it, whatever you'd like to do. Um, but the, the the guidance we've gotten now is um, we any draft resolution that we have uh, to the extent practicable, we'll try to get up um, as early as 20 or 48 hours before the meeting if we if we have it available. Um, so you should always check that link to see if there's any resolutions that are teed up for a vote uh, that have been pre-written for a meeting. So with that, I will. <laughs> Okay, as, as people are looking at this, um, so kind of information I want to throw out there is there's a precedent of a similarly situated community, which is Roosevelt Island, where they're governed by a board comprised exclusively of residents of Roosevelt Island. Um, and denying us the same benefit is not, it's not fair, it's arbitrary and capricious. I, I know people will say Roosevelt Island is different. We are a cash cow and we generate income for the city. Um, Roosevelt Island does not. But that should not alone be a reason not to allow us to be self-governing. To some degree, at least have a majority, not not 100%. Um, so I think that's number one. Number two, um, I think it is really important that we have a diverse and economically diverse as well as racially diverse as possible um, representation on the board of the Battery Park City Authority. Um, it, it's, it is important to have people who actually know Battery Park City, live in Battery Park City, work in Battery Park City, represent us. Um, and that is just not the case with the current iteration of the board, despite the fact that we do have two um, Battery Park City res residents on the board. I do not believe, I don't know for a fact, but I do not believe that either one of those folks would call Battery Park City their primary residence. But I don't know 100%. So. I'm not calling anybody out, but I think that should be a criteria. And I think there should be some criteria for a little bit of economic diversity. But bottom line is we have spoken this board on three separate occasions in the past. Back in 2016 and 2017, when we were calling at that time, we started off with a call for a majority four out of seven people from residents of Battery Park City to be appointed to the board. Um, thanks to the legislative efforts, as it says here, of, of our um, assembly members Glick, New, and Seawright, who joined onto it, and at the time, Senator Squadron, Daniel Squadron, whose seat is now being occupied by um, Senator Brian Kavanaugh. Um, the bills were sponsored, and it ended up coming down that what passed both the Assembly and the Senate of New York State was that two members of the seven member board be residents of Battery Park City. So that was a win. It was not everything, but it was a win and we were happy and it lasted from 2017 until 2021. And now um, I think kind of what kind of woke us up a little bit, woke me up a little bit, is the fact of George, kind of the, I will say the events of this summer with the, with the um, memorial and the frustration. And I am grateful and thank, thankful to George Sunas for being able to stop the governor from forcing the um, monument, the essential workers down North Roads and saving the, the green space in Rockefeller Park and creating a committee. However, um, the fact that it was even on the table was outrageous. And, um, you know, that's one small piece of uh, issue that the authority was facing. And um, I don't know that a Resident majority would, would have changed that situation. I don't know that it would or wouldn't have, but um, I don't think we would have had to have people sleeping on the grass to get people's attention because I think if people who actually lived here would be speaking up loudly and vociferously. Um, and I, you know, whatever, I, I certainly don't think anybody on the board was happy with that. And I think it was shoved down their throats. Um, so I'm thankful it was moved on. But with George Sunis being tapped on the shoulder for, um, a possible ambassadorship to Greece, we will have at least one opening. And I think the time is ripe for us to weigh in and say, number one, we want re more residents, we want more representation from Battery Park City to be appointed. And in keeping with um, kind of the thought process that Jimmy raised, but it's always near and dear in my heart, um, I think there needs to be income diversity. And I will go to my little, cute little chart, which anybody can see, but going to the 2021, uh, you know, can my income qualify me for affordable housing? They do an area median income chart, and uh, it is considered middle income in New York City, of which New York 
uh, of which um, battery proximity is a part, um, for between 121% and 165% of area median income. That was my suggestion. Um, I'm open to different suggestions if that you think that number needs to be higher because that number is for one person up to a uh, $138,000 a year income, two people, 158,000, three people, 177,000, four people, 196,000 as annual income. If that is not, if that makes the pool too small, which I don't think it does, based on my reading of the census report of 2019 of the people who live in Battery Park City, which stated that 54%, I believe, of the people who live here, at least 54%, um, make under $150,000 a year. But I would, don't, don't, that is not a quotable fact. I want to have it on the charts and we can pull them up and look at them together and make sure that I'm getting that specifically accurate. But there is a number of people who would fall into that category, of which, as you know, um, Eric and Jimmy noted, you've got lawyers in this community, you've got doctors in this community, you've got accountants, you've got real estate people, you've got a lot of people with a lot of education, a lot of information, and you've also have people who've lived here for a very long time. I think at least one member of the board of, of, of the Battery Park City Board needs to be somebody who is primary residence is in Battery Park City, and another member at least needs to be someone below 165% of the AMI. I open this up for discussion and um, tweaks or whatever else to the um, resolution as written, but let's move forward with it. Raise your hand or just unmute yourself. I see no one's hands raised, so okay, I see Jimmy raising his hand. Go ahead, Jimmy, you speak. Anybody else want to speak? And I'm sure Jeff Galloway, you're going to want to say something because I know you have, I, I couldn't read your email yet, but um, I, I know you have something to say, so that's totally fair. Uh, Jimmy, you first, and then Jeff. Uh, you have to unmute yourself, Jimmy. Sorry, um, Justin, you brought up a really good point. Like, what really um, got me um, understand what's going on was actually the memorial situation. It just <laughs> now you see the problem of basically living in a colony, right? Yes. <laughs> you have a governor that's appointed by the king. And, and the people actually, and then with a problem, you become very, very quickly become a very confrontational situation. Mm -hmm. and if there's anything good about democracy, it's representation, and that will that is very, very important to keep really, you know, peace. Uh -huh. right? So I think that this is very important. This resolution is very, very important. We need to make sure there's enough economic and um, even economic, social diversity in this um, in this board. Thank you. I, I agree with you 100 percent clearly. Jeff and then Betty. Um, I, I think that I, I, I basically support uh, the resolution. I do have a, a, a tweak or two. Um, um, well, why don't I just get into the tweaks? Because I think yeah. I end up covering my um, uh, substantive points. One is in, in the whereas it says lessons learned. Let's see. What is that? Um, uh, oh, yeah, bottom whereas there. Um, uh, uh, yes, uh, lessons learned from the 2017 law are that there's a clear need for income diversity. I, I think income diversity and primary residency are certainly worthy objectives, but I don't see how in the world those are lessons learned from the 2017 uh, law. Uh, unless what you mean to do is criticize the two residents. <laughs> uh, uh, who are on the board, which I'm not sure, even if we wanted to criticize would be a very politic thing to do in a resolution that we're actually trying to get some action from. Yeah, um, that's so, so I would suggest not <laughs> describing that as a lesson learned, but saying that, that the, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, proper, uh, let me get to the other tweak, which is really a conceptual point, which I think- Wait, before you go to the next tweak, I am fine with just saying, um, there are there is a clear need today there is a clear need um or well why don't you hear my next second point okay. because i think the second point relates to this and that is what we really want is not necessarily residents what we want although we may need to have residents to get what we want 
Hmm. But um, what we really want are board members who will engage with the community and not just view themselves uh, as uh, bean counters to make sure that the taxpayers of the state of New York get the largest return uh, from their investment here and who don't even know that children play on a lawn in Rockefeller Park until parents are out there sleeping in front of um, uh, bulldozers that, that's about to tear the place up. And sort of the assumption we're making in having residents is that residents are more likely um, to engage with the community than non-residents. Um, so I, I think there should be a whereas that basically says that it's, you know, that 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 board members should not mute should not um, be appointed or view their 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 jobs as purely uh, stewards of the New York State budget, uh, but uh, also appreciate uh, and view as part of their mandate uh, uh, the, the community itself, which, by the way, I think the management of Battery Park City Authority does a good job of. But, but we're asking for the board uh, membership to be selected as, as that's one of the criteria. And, and, and having someone who is a primary residence here, as well as some income diversity, I think makes it more likely that those who are chosen for the board uh, will be uh, more engaged with the community than, than you know, someone who's rewarded for good political service um, uh, with, with, with an appointment like this. It's not like being the ambassador to some country Yes. Uh, one could, one, well, I mean, I don't want to pick on poor Mr. Sunis, who, who acquitted himself, I think, quite well in, in the yeah. end on, on, yes. on all of this and on a number of other issues in, in the community. But whether it's Greece or any other country, I mean, the fact of the matter is lots of ambassadors are purely political appointments. And, you know, maybe that's just the name of the game. But the, the, the board membership of something like Battery Park City Authority shouldn't simply be a political reward. I think that makes sense, and I agree with that. Um, so, what I really liked was your part of your comment about um, uh, uh, the statement that um, future board members should not, or actually any board member, maybe even, but uh, future board members should not consider themselves only as a steward to collect more and more and more income. I, I I will have to listen to the tape to hear what you said, but I liked that a lot. Um, and I don't know that, I do think that people who actually have this as a primary residence, it would accomplish that. But but I think that there also needs to be a clear uh, message given. Now that the Battery Park City has been built out and it's, and it's maintenance and preservation of a community, focus changes. And part of their responsibility, and I think a large part needs to be maintaining the community yeah, and the structure that's, that's and correct. the diversity. Yes. And that gets lost if all you're doing is looking to generate as much income as possible from the people that live here. You have what Jimmy was saying and, and what Eric is saying. You've got people who are constantly churned out. Whoever can pay more can stay. Pay more, stay. That's not community. Right. That's not that doesn't build anything. That 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 generates income, but it builds nothing with community. And and I think that that. I am open to, to wording that would address that definitely. And then, um, yeah, suggest something. And then I'm fine if you want to say something, lessons learned. I'm not looking to, to insult any, I don't, um, I, this was like Lucian's language here. So Lucian, you can maybe help out where you were going with this, but I'm not looking to submit, to insult any board members now. I, I think that the lessons learned to me are that there has been a lack of focus on income diversity and affordability and the lessons learned is that two are not enough. That's the lesson that I learned, but that's, that's what I hear. Two, two representatives right. are not enough. And in fact, it's not just people who call, who own, an, who own property in Battery Park City who can be um, stewards of this neighborhood. Um, it, Justine, can I jump yes, in? Yes, you may. Go ahead. Oh, actually, um, yes, go ahead, Robin, then Betty, if that's okay, because you haven't spoken yet. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, add something to what Jeff said and um, maybe expand a little bit on what you said. Um, in terms of uh, expanding the, bat, the, the board 
to encompass a larger percentage of residents. I couldn't agree more, but I think one of the things in terms of diversity is that we also need to blend the board to have both owners and renters. And I think that that's something that has been lacking. And certainly the people on the board who live in Battery Park City represent a certain constituency. And, you know, when we talk about economic diversity, we also need to talk about ownership versus, you know, long term residency. People like Jeff and me. Correct. Been here, you know, 30 plus years. I think rent. Scroll <laughs> down. I think, does it, Lucian, don't, let me say that. As well, I did I didn't see it? No, you can, and it's not showing on the screen now. I believe we asked for that. Okay, um, good. positive. If not, that was something that I wanted to ask. Yeah, for, okay, because I agree you. with you. It needs. It should be really one, uh, one resident, uh, one owner, and one renter, who then fits into this. You know, and then I mean, if if in fact there are not going to be any more condo conversions, we'll see, mm -hmm. or uh, co-op conversions then I think the distribution or the mixture of the board should be proportionate to the rental versus ownership uh, distribution within Battery Park City, but that's me. I Okay, so Jeff and, and Robin, if you can put together something as a whereas, because I'd like to vote on this and get this done, but Betty, you're next. And, and give me some language that make, and then we can vote on the language, because I'm open to that suggestion. Betty, go ahead. Yeah, actually, I, I have a different point of view, so I want to bring it up. I have lived next door to elected officials. That doesn't mean that they represent me any better than somebody who lives in another community in my same district. So I am not tied so much to this. If somebody lives here and has lived here for 30, 40 years, they're gonna reflect what I, about every Battery Park City resident wants more than somebody else. I, I don't buy that at all. But second of all, it's my concern is more do they have the governor's ear? Do they go out and, as Jeff said, get involved in the community and know what the issues are and kind of how people feel? Uh, somebody who sits around their house or second home or third home is just as disengaged whether you consider them a resident or not. And I see no evidence whatsoever that Roosevelt Island is better off because they have all residents on their board. I mean, what do they have that we don't have? So control. <laughs> control over what and what has it done for them? I, I'm more into outcomes than I am into symbols that may mean nothing. So given they're still appointed people, I'd rather one they have the skill set to deal with the problems and to initiate issues because that's really what their job is. I also would like them to be able to care enough about the community, they get to know a diversity of the people that live in the community and know the issues. Uh, that's a lot to ask, but nevertheless, to me, those are the things that are important, not how long an individual is and reflecting their personal beliefs. And some of it is we can't blame the board for members of the community not going to their meetings and speaking up. How about blaming the board for not coming to the community's meetings and not not showing up? They live here. It's on Zoom. Why aren't they not here? I mean, Nick comes, and, and thank, thankfully, Nick comes and he reports back, I'm certain. But that's not the same as having a board member show up. But my, my, but my I guess my answer to you is, yes, what you say makes, that, that all makes sense, but none of that's being done by this current iteration of the board. We, right, we, it's also not what you're asking for either. That's my whole point, so thanks. Uh, Okay, no, thank you. Um, I don't know if I agree with you fully, but um, all right, so Jimmy and then Bob, but thank you, Betty, for sharing. Oh, my question is, how is the board being um, composed right now? Is it all picked by the governor? Is that how it works? Always, yes, that is how, it's, that is how it has always worked. And mm -hmm. there's seven people now, of which two ostensibly live in Battery Park City, Martha Gallo and um, Anthony Kendall, I believe. Martha is a long time resident who's lived here for a very long time in the South neighborhood, but I do not believe. Right. So essentially, um, um unless we change the law that governs the 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 yes. of the board, is it we're actually basically just begging the governor, right? So Correct. I think that well, so this is kind of like a love letter to the governor. So we should just, you know, let them know that 
what we prefer, right? And it's a general trend. I mean, in the corporate world, more and more, they realize how important the board is, right? So mm -hmm. they're trying to make the board more diverse, more involved. So it's not just a, a private club of the um, of buddies. Um, and um, so actually, you know, the board's job is really just like a corporate board. They're mm -hmm. there to make sure that everything are done right, right? So, so what we're doing is we're not asking any different from um, what's going on all around America right now is to make sure that um, that there's that the board becoming more engaged and more um, interested in the community and also um, um, you know, more reflective of you know what's going on. So I, I think that we just actually the government should just do the right thing instead of having this kind of closed door private club situation where you know board members are kind of disengaged. They should if they're truly put the interest of the state's assets then this should be a diverse board period agree um do you are you okay with the language that's here do you think it should be stronger if you have i i, I don't have enough experience drafting these um resolutions so i'll leave that to you know the more experienced members and uh, lucian um because what it says here is we're asking the governor hochel and whoever comes after her to electively create to, to electively create a residential majority which i think lucian you're trying to say that when you say electively create, I don't know what that word means. Do you mean you're, you're saying we have an election to create them instead versus appointment? No, to, uh, instead of being bound by law to fill uh, open spots with residents ah, to be elected. in 2072, yeah. choose to do so without having without being forced to by law. Until such legislation is passed, but we want the law mm -hmm. to pass. Um, That's right. I, I hear what you're saying. Um, okay. Oh. I think I'm okay with this language here. Um, yeah, I mean, okay. I'm gonna go to Bob. I'm thinking about it, and Judith, then you're next. I'm thinking about how to to add something if necessary, Jimmy. I, I'm thinking. Go ahead, Bob. Okay. The first thing I wanted to uh, just at least comment on was you, uh, Justine mentioned the interest in the community. And as when I was uh, speaking the last time, the, the part of that interest I wanted to mention was seniors. And that one of the one of the constituencies that we should try and help and protect is NORCs, as, as naturally occurring retirement communities. And I think it's so sad for me to have some of my very good friends priced out of living here and on the other hand, when we kind of look at the Taylor age people to look at the young people who are also priced out of out of living here, which so in terms of the community, I think. Um, in, in terms of the, in terms of the community, I think we should at least add uh, the older people and the younger people as two constituencies that are important to look at. The next thing I wanted to comment on is Roosevelt Island and results. Uh, I was shopping around the city a little bit, and I got to see in Roosevelt <laughs> that it's easily a third less expensive to live there. And the amenities for actual people are terrific everywhere. And the thing and things are so much more affordable if it were attached. It's just a miracle if you're really stuck and looking for a place to live. I would suggest my best friend go up up there because they can get the most value per square foot that they can in this in in anything related to Manhattan. So I think the uh, and I actually know the um, the chair of the Roosevelt Island committee uh, at Roosevelt Island that they're just kind of like Justine is Battery Park City committee and they really are devoted to residents and affordability. And they've been that way for years and years, and that really matters. So if we want to do research on this, we can easily prove uh, that they live well for less. Uh, that's the point I'd make there. The next thing is in terms of what I'll call, I think it's really, I think that on some level, one of the most creative possible jobs is to be in politics. <laughs> and to have the political job of being a council member, a senator, or whatever, because it's absolutely creative. 
no one has made a job description for you and you can go out there and if I were the most creative uh, person, I could really do things like maybe uh, Moynihan did, for example. I could be that creative that I could really affect the community in some really profound way. The other part of that is just selecting a checkbox of, uh, of type. So I have so many people who are inside an income group and I have so many people who are of a certain age and I have, so, it's, I think that when you select those people, you don't necessarily get votes that represent that. And, and what I've noticed is that people who represent a certain class going into these things within the first week after they're elected, they've been attached, they've been approached by all the lobbyists, et cetera. And they quickly change their tune. Very rarely do they hold to the same kind of position that you'd imagine if Jimmy Stewart got the job in the beginning. So uh, I'm not sure that I believe in the checkbox, and I'm not sure. I am sure, on the other hand, that as a as a board member on the Battery Park City Committee, I have a certain responsibility to represent the community, and that's why. When we were trying to save the bridge, we actually got 3,601 local signatures within a four block area. And that, of course, didn't matter or impress anybody, but by God, it was, oh, it it was, was about local representation. So it's really hard to select how you select the people on the board. If you can't do any better, I think the idea of having, you know, residents for sure residents of a certain, uh, that are renters or condo owners or owners of buildings. I think, well, that's important, but I think it's, that's a big discussion or that you select it because you would select Justine because she's a lawyer, she's extremely creative, she's really energetic, she's really an activist. So you cho choose someone like that because she's, she's got the, the local, the personal fizzazz to do the job brilliantly. So it's just different ways to look at that. And I, I think how we, how we select the people or how we suggest those people be selected is a, is, a, is, a big, is a big question. And I rest my case. Thank you, Bob. Judith, and then um, I'm gonna answer, I've got, I think I've put together some suggestions for what I'll call it a friendly amendment. But go ahead, Judith. Um, so Justine, I guess a couple of things. One is, can I see the first page again? Yeah, um, go ahead, Lucian. <laughs> um, if you could, yeah, if you could just scroll down, because uh, I didn't, get, I didn't get a chance to read the whole thing. Um, this is mostly history. Okay. Keep going. So, is it really just the second page that has the? Yes, it's the second page that has it. So this is where we start off with the lessons learned. So, Lucian, if you're there, you can change this, or you can't. This is this is the Google Docs. So you can change it. So I think that we at least highlight lessons learned because okay. that was something that I'm I'm willing to change. Um, I I just I just wanted to um, you know express my view and respond to to some of the things that have been said. I I think that you know I'm definitely I'm definitely first of all I want to say I'm definitely in support of a resolution like this. I don't, I don't have a strong view on what it should look like, but um, you know I think that. You know, I, I don't want to get too political here, but we're talking about taxation without representation. I mean, that's basically yeah. if we, <laughs> we have, you know, we have two problems that I think Bob identified. I think you identified one and Bob identified another. I mean, there's one problem is that we're not represented. And the second problem is that um, it's appointed. <laughs> and I think, you know, an election might be more appropriate, but we can, we can save that. We can save that discussion for another day. Um, but I just think that in terms of getting a majority, and I think some people would argue that, that could argue that not just a majority, but but everybody yeah. uh, on the board. So I, I, I think I think getting two people on the board as as happened a few years ago is sort of a small victory. Um, I think getting majority would be a bigger victory. I think a win, a complete win would be everybody because you know, we're supposed to be represented here. And I think, I think the problem is that when you have people that don't live in this neighborhood, 
you know, as Justine has mentioned a number of times, like we're a cash cow and it just becomes a business decision. And I, and I, I don't want to say that, you know, um, those that are on the authority don't want us to have a good place to live because that's not what I'm saying, but I'm just saying that, um, you know, it, it may be operated more of a business um, and, and less of a neighbor as a neighborhood of where, where people live. And I think um, a, a number of areas, um, it, ways in which we're affected by this have been identified in, at this meeting already. I mean, mm -hmm. I think Bob mentioned, you know, some of the amenities are just, maybe they're too expensive. So not only are we paying more um, to live here, but then we also have sort of the cost of living by the food and whatever the amenities are that are expensive um, and, 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 you know, don't necessarily benefit the people that live here and might be more for those that work here. Um, I mean, I think, you know, we've talked about the ground rents a lot. We're negotiating, we're essentially negotiating with people that don't live in Battery Park City. So, I mean, I think that's, that's kind of a problem. Um, I think that, you know, we all saw what happened with the Essential Workers Monument and, you know, the, the idea was kind of to get more people to visit the area and visit the monument. And I think, you know, there's a lot of people that live here who, who feel like, well, first of all, the idea that green space would be torn down to do that was, was pretty appalling, um, given how little green space there is in the city to begin with. But, you know, I, I don't want to get digressed too much on that, but when the head of the Battery Park City Authority came to talk, one of the things he said was, no, I really care about this community. I live 25 miles away. And I think, you know, that that may have struck some people. 25 miles. Wow. Yeah. Um, that, Better than Florida. I, I, it, it, you know, it, that that to me is troublesome. And um, and then finally, you know, the the issue that we just talked about, um, you know, rentals or rental going to co-op. So I think I think there's a lot of different ways in which not being represented affects us. Um, and, and I think, you know, we should, we should have a vote in our own community. Um, so, so to me, this is, this is, this is a no brainer. Yeah, I agree. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Jeff, I'll let you go. I have suggested language, but I'm gonna let you go first and let's see. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, actually I was going to make. Oh, good. Let's hear I, I text, it. I, I sent you some suggested language uh, in the in the chat that I think may have gone to you and Lucian. I don't know. Uh, I think uh, it just goes to Lucian, but maybe. Um, uh, uh, but uh, before I, I want to say that I don't disagree with Betty's comments. And in fact, Justine, you may recognize them as very similar to what I told you on the phone earlier this morning. Yeah. Uh, but I but I am prepared to believe or to assume that residents are more likely to engage with the community than non-residents. And so I do support this resolution. Um, but the whereas that I'm suggesting we add kind of yeah. goes to this. Um, well, Lucia, can you share what, 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 at least share it with me? <laughs> but share what, and then Jeff, please, go, please keep going. I mean, I can. Um, or re and read it, yeah, tell me. Uh, it, it reads. Um, uh, whereas the BPC board should be comprised of individuals who will view their mandate as extending beyond simply being stewards of public funds. Like that. We will also engage with the community with the objective of maintaining and enhancing the affordability and quality of residential life. Um, and I mean, I'm not wedded to that particular uh, language, I but love it. Uh, I mean, that, okay, that general so thought, I think, is something that's important. I, I am in, I like it. Um, let me look at it again and think about it, but yeah, let me, um, sorry, Lucian, so if you can let it to be on one page or if possible or not, but that's, that is, that is exactly what I picked up on. So the board should be comprised of individuals who will view their mandate as extending beyond simply being stewards of public funds. Perfect. But who will also engage with the community with the objective of maintaining and enhancing the affordability and quality of residential life. How about just quality of residential and commercial life, right? I'm, I'm willing to throw in That's there. Fine with me. Yeah, I mean, I know, because that was something that, that you had raised. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay, or just quality of, yeah, and commercial life, right? Is that the people who live and work here? That, yeah. That's what I'm looking That's to. Fine. That's fine. 
and that gives it a little bit more recognition of the fact that we're not just, it is a neighborhood of, of more than just people who live here. So I'm liking that. Um, I will be. And, and by the way, let me give Robin some credit for this language too. Thank you, you know, Robin. Thank you, Robin. And thank, and thank you, Jeff. Um, so I think that let's talk about lessons learned from the. My pleasure. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And um, Bob, I know you raised your hand. I'm pushing you off because I want to get this done. And I, I will come back On to you. Lessons learned. I think the suggestion was just get rid of the yeah, lessons. Yeah. Learned are we good with that? And just say. Started with <laughs> there is a clear need. Yeah. So why don't we just do that? I'm, I accept that as a totally friendly amendment and I'm good with this. So solution to destroy it. The next thing, just erase and put a capital T. There is a clear need. Today, there is a clear need or whatever. If you have, you want to some right, right here, the, the paragraph right underneath it. There is now a yeah, you know, yeah. clear need or something. Something like that. Yeah, there's now a clear need. Yes, exactly. I want that. I, could I just make a really quick comment? Uh, wait, unless it's going to be specific to language. I, well, I think it is at least a point that I think belongs in this. I'm not I think it's always been true that that Battery Park City could be revert to governance by New York City for a dollar if that uh, if the okay. conditions are right. I think that the, it should it it's meaningful to say that the BPCA has provided years of really professional management and really delivered a competent product, and that you know and that, I want the and that residential in. oversight of that um, could add an element of value to that quality of oversight. Possibly come up with some language. I don't know that we need to go there. I don't know that we, because I don't feel like we're insulting the board or the battery proxy authority here. I, I'm usually pretty good about saying, uh, you know, giving them credit and saying what a great job they're doing because they are, they do a great job. They have done a great job of building this place out. They do a great job of, of keeping being stewards. What they're not doing a great job of is keeping it affordable and keeping it as a community. And you know, that's where we have to work together to do better. Um, but I will let, let me think about that on that latter point. I mean, I think certainly the management has. tried. I mean, we're talking about the board here and the management. Uh, has forever, not just the current management forever had to operate within the constraints that the board allows them to operate. Correct. within. and I think the perception of many of us in the community. Is that the board. Speaking for the governor, and there's been lots of different governors. That it's not just the most recent mm -hmm. one. Um, have have viewed Battery Park City as a source of funds, yes. and a source of monuments, and a source of things that are not necessarily the where the residents are not necessarily priorities. I think historically, most of the management, including the current management, has notwithstanding that, Pride. done a good job uh, in. Um, uh, in supporting the community and in and making it the wonderful place that it that it is, but what we're speaking to here is, it shouldn't be just left to the, to the board to to the to the you know to yeah. the staff to do that, but this should be should something be that's ingrained in the board itself. I agree with that. Now, if okay, so now if if you think that so that needs to be said and added, I'm good with it, because it kind of encapsulates what Bob was saying. Yeah, what, I don't know if I have that language to add to that, but I think that's the point that Bob was making. No, I, just, I agree with that point. The thing I wanted to say is that in terms of, of facility management, in terms of grounds management, they've really done a great thing okay, in terms of doing it. In terms of fiscal all... management, they really represent the governor. And I, I, I resent being considered a cash cow. I, I get taken agree. advantage of in the city all the time to live in a community where people say, oh, you're living in a cash cow, aren't you? I just kind of go, wait a second. It, I don't think that's an outcome that I really uh, want to have kind well, of blown in my direction. And so I think that what we want to look at is the fiscal management and how we make this affordable and how we, we make it work for everyone. But on the other hand, we okay. appreciate the skills um, of actual uh -oh. professional management. Well, Sorry. Well, no, it's okay. I'm stopping you because yes, you, 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 no one's disagreeing with you. You're right. I'm not sure that that is something that we need to say in this resolution. Um, if you want to put pen to paper and come up with something that kind of summarizes it along the lines of the way that Jeff said it, which I think is, is exactly what you're saying, 
I would be open to it as a possibility, but I want to vote on this. I want to close this out quickly and I want to ask your all of your opinion and it's a yes or no on this next whereas or wherefore of, I'm not sure what it is. I heard what Robin said, what um, Judith was saying, what Jimmy said, you said, um, and I think somewhat what Jeff said, I'm not sure I'm catching what Betty said in full, but um, one of the things that seemed to be, um, two things seem to be, I'm hearing, um, how are people appointed, okay? So what if we had a whereas um, community board one asks that we move to having the community elect a slate of acceptable candidates from which the governor could then choose to appoint board members as vacancies occur with the goal towards having at least one member be a renter and one member be an owner. And this way we are having some say which in, in who is being picked as a pool of people, but the governor has final choice because it should be the governor who's having final choice because I'm, I'm okay with that and, that and that's not taking power away, but it is saying, hey, these are the residents and these are the people that we're looking for in any way, shape or form, but beyond wordsmithing it, either yes or no right now, so we could always come back and revisit it. Um, no from me. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's do it. Let's go. Through. Yeah. Just, uh, this is Judy. I'm, I'm going to say no only because I think if we do that, this could take longer and be more, you know, I okay. think, this, I think maybe we should take that up if we win this battle. There you go. Take up the elected issue, but I think if we, that's going to be a huge ask and yeah. may make this resolution the ba the important part of this most important part of this resolution less successful. Perfect. Then let's. I, I I agree with Judith completely. Let's not get bogged down in the details of it now. Then, let's then, let's get approval in concept. Okay, so are we good with this then? Can we call the question with the changes that that uh, Jeff added, Jeff and Robin's language? And um, I don't think we need to add the new language that Bob was suggesting about fiscal. I don't think we need to add it now. I think this will be revisited like it was in 2017 and 2016. I think we're gonna be having more conversations about this as this pushes forward, depending what and if our legislators move, you know, if there's a bill that's written if it gets pushed through, whatever. So I think that this can be tweaked and moved forward, but I think we need to speak now. And I think Justine, this is pretty substantial. Yep. Um, you've got uh, a couple comments from the attendees. Let's hear them. Great, okay. Sanjay Reddy, I'm requesting to unmute your mic. Uh, Sanjay, you may have to unmute yourself too. Because, there you go, now you're unmuted. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, one question I have is, um, has anyone taken a look at the charter or any governance um, requirements of the board? You know, the simple question I have is, is the board meeting its responsibility to the community? Is that responsibility spelled out anywhere uh, in the charter or other, you know, governance material that, um, you know, governs the Battery Park Authority, Battery Park City Authority. I don't. And the reason why I'm asking that question, it, it could simply be that that um, they're not fulfilling their responsibility to their to the community as it's outlined in their charter, and we haven't called them out on that. Mm, I think. Well, you know what? I don't know the answer to your question. I, I don't feel as if the current. I, I don't know. Anybody have a comment back on that one? I'm not willing to pull this resolution to find the answer to that question, by the way. But I appreciate yeah, that, that's fine. But I think that's yeah. a question this group should consider. Uh, Mr. Reddy, I think that's a it's a it's a great it's a, um, yeah it is great recommendation, and I'll I'll definitely look to find that the appropriate section of the charter to see what um, what expectations that it has for board members. Yeah, because all I have is information about generally what the authority's role is, what their what their mission is, and stuff like that. And are they doing it? Sure. The only thing that they're not doing is affordability. 
Christine, can I say, do you want to look at Nick's hand is up? Oh, Nick, yeah, thank you. I, I can't see everything like that. But yes, Nick, go ahead, speak. Oh, Sanjay, oh, excuse me, Sanjay, are you okay? Are you yeah, that's. I just wanted to make that point. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I'm done. Okay, perfect. Hey, Justine, I didn't want to know. I just had it up for when you're done with everyone else. Anyone else has any comments? Please let them go first. I think everybody's whose hand is raised now is um, spoken already. So go ahead, Nick, and you close this down, I think. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm sorry for my background. I am. Uh, no, I had a little one having dinner in the other room. So I'm in the bedroom. That's why the uh, overhead lighting is not the most flattering. I apologize. And you're funny. Um, see you. So thank you. And I don't obviously have a lot to add here. We don't have. Um, we, uh, the management of Battery Park City Authority obviously doesn't have uh, a say or a role in kind of appointing any board members, obviously. Um, but I would, I would just say in the interest of, uh, you know, in the interest of having the record straight, I, I, I would opine that I, 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 from where I'm sitting and my experience in being here, and I say it all the time, but it's true because it's a lot of time, just so you know. I know you do. You at every... Battery Park City Committee meeting for the past almost six years, every one, without missing a beat. Mm -hmm. I, I would say from where I'm sitting, I think it's, it's categorically untrue to say that the board of the Battery Park City Authority as currently constituted is not attuned to what the priorities of residents are, at least the priorities as we repeatedly hear them here and in other public forums. Affordability, resiliency, sustainability. We talk about it all the time. There are items on every agenda of the board. We have executive sessions, which are executive sessions, but there are things that are discussed in those sessions directly related to the concerns that are here. It doesn't mean that the answer, let's just say that Justine Cuccia wants exactly every time that she gets exactly the answer she wants, but that's not the same. It's not the same as saying the board isn't aware of and attuned to those issues uh, and working diligently on them. So I just I need to, I just need to make clear for our board we have an incredible group of diverse professionals who are really talented and continually keep us uh, on task during those meetings to make sure we are getting the the best value and the the bang for the buck um, for the money the public dollars that we are spending on any of the range of projects that we continue to work on across uh, across the community um, now does it go down to the level of there's a dog on the lawn. No, not for every board member because people are, you know, working on other things, just like it doesn't for every community board member. Mm -hmm. But have I had conversations with Catherine Hughes, God bless her, on <laughs> very, very minute details of the neighborhood? Yes, because she is, you know, extraordinarily engaged. Yeah. But uh, to say that our board isn't engaged or attuned to, you know, the top line priorities of what we continually hear from the community, it's just, it's not true. Nick, I hear you and I appreciate that. And again, I think the authority has done an amazing job of building this community. No, I know. And this and you guys were this was very tame by community board standards. I just yeah, no. I wanted to make that clear for my but, board. But, they're they're a real bunch of pros and uh we you know we work at their pleasure. You know, part of my being here every month is a want by the board to make sure that we are represented at every community board meeting um to get the feedback. I appreciate that and it's not a reflection by us saying that they're not showing up here. It's no, 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 absolutely. You. I get it. I it's, get it. I just want to say doing, it. And it's no reflection on you. It is a question that it'd be something that I would want to know and see, especially as you're hearing so much agita agitation about affordability and there's so much going on. I, yeah, no, it's fair. You guys should absolutely advocate for the things that you want to see. I just wanted to make sure that I got that on the record. That's totally okay. So right. thank you. Oh, thank okay. you for the time. And also, the resolution does not contain yeah. criticism. No, right. absolutely. I think the resolution, I think the language as it goes is uh, is well above board. And, and that was our point is, is that there's, a, there's nothing to complain about. It, it's the, com the complaint is that we want more representation because we want to have a bigger say is what we think we're going to get with that and more awareness. And that's not because you're not showing up, Nick, because you are. Um, with that, I want to close this discussion down and can someone call the question or could I call the question? And if someone would second it. One call the question. question. Okay. Can I second it? Lucian, am I allowed? Second it. Okay, you can second it too and call it. All right, so can we just take a quick vote? Um, and Lucian, let if you Yeah, let me just do a quick uh, roll call because I want to just make sure that we have everybody here. God help me. Justine? Yes. Sarah Cassell? I think she signed off. She, which 
that. She's moving her sister. She said she voted yes, but that's not going to count. Yeah. I told Eric her Flores? Yes. Flores, yes. Galloway? Galloway, yes. Kay? Kay, abstain. Schneck? Yes. Sung? Yes. Weinstock? Judith? Unmute. Sorry, I'm here. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Forced? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. The eyes have it. Thank you, everyone. I thought that was a really good discussion. Just. Justine, you're muted. Oh. I'm just pontificating, saying nothing important. I'm saying thank you to everybody. Well said, Robin, and you're right. I'm, I'm grateful for this board for putting in the <laughs> effort and energy for mm -hmm. um, on this issue because it's so important. All right, next is um, request to include community board one in discussions for the formulation of future joint purpose fund targets discussion and resolution um all right i'm hoping that this is a quick um no-brainer does everybody on the board understand what the joint purpose fund is speak up if you don't and jeff is it your hand raised to speak about it uh yes i uh, have you two can comments, start. but i'll wait until you're done okay does does everybody know what it is no. um eric I, I have no idea. Okay. So, um, a quick little idea of what's going on here. Okay. There was back in 1980, and, and if you pull up the resolution, Lucian, I think that it gives us some background. Um, in back in 1980, um, a settlement agreement was entered into between the city of New York, uh, the state of New York, uh, the New York State. Uh, Urban Development Corporation and the Battery Park City Authority, whereby it gave the Battery Park City the authority to collect all of our money, right? The cash cow that we are, it, it collects all of our money and it delineates what it's collecting. It's collecting pilot, which is payment in lieu of taxes. It collects ground rent and it collects civic fees. As that money comes in, the authority has explained to us, they take all the money, they stir it around and they look at it and say, okay, how much of this came in from ground rent? And I'm making a generalization. Usually that's about 20%, give or take. Sometimes it's 17, sometimes it's 20, sometimes it's 19. Who cares? Let's go with 20. 80% ish comes from um, pilot. Making it simple, I'm not dealing with the civic fees right now. But so you've got 80 and 20, right? Big buckets. The way that is split according to the settlement agreement is between the joint purpose fund and the general fund for this New York, New York City. The New York City general fund pays for things like your police, your fire, your DOT, housing, you name it, whatever the things the city runs, that's what the general purpose fund is, okay? The general fund is, right? Um, the joint purpose fund is a, I'm gonna call them buckets, but maybe they're targets. What has happened over the years since 1980 is there's been a number of uh, targets or buckets set forth usually around four, usually it's around $800,000. The last iteration was done in 2010 and it was for 810 and uh, 861 million. I said thousand before, I mean million, $861 million. And the 2010 amendment came up with a plan where I know one can see this, right? Came up with a plan by which the joint purpose fund buckets were um, uh, 20 million for the general Fund of New York State, 20 million for the New York City General Fund, 20 million for affordable housing. And the last bucket, which is being filled or has been filled as we speak, um, is uh, 20, 261 million for the New York City Capital Fund. Is it 20 million or 200 million? 200, I'm sorry. I, um, I reading backwards and it's 200, 200, 200, and 261. Sorry. Um, I think that all says it right there. It's broken out on this thing. Um, Just, 
I'd like to ask a question that I don't know the answer to. The uh, the general fund uh, accounts, uh, the state and the city, and the affordable housing. When um, are those fulfilled? They're done. It's They're, so the only one left is the capital. The only one left is the New York State Capital Fund, and I believe that the authority has stated that it is filled as of the end of 2021. And Wait, I think that's good. Thank you. That's all. That's all. Five dollars. Say that again. That's correct. Yeah, so we're done. So, so now we have the, 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 the joint purpose fund um, targets have all been met. So then what happens? According to the settlement agreement, and Nick, you can correct me if I'm wrong with this, but according to that 1980 settlement agreement, once there's no more purpose or buckets for the joint purpose fund to fill, the money just gets put into a bank account or put someplace and held until they decide how to spend it next time. And again, it goes in that 80-20 split, uh, proportional, proportional to the ground run in and pilot in, that's general purpose fund and, and joint purpose fund. So that's how those monies are decided. One nice feature as far as residents, I think, well, anybody who's paying into the, to, the, to this is concerned, there's no um, requirement of any amount certainly being paid in a year. So we had $861 million to be paid. It took them, what, 11 years, 20? Yeah, 11 years to fill it. It could have taken them 12. It could have taken them 15. It could have taken them three. There's no criteria of it how much or, or how little gets put into it each year, just as long as it gets split 80 20. From after the Battery Park City Authority pays off its, uh, from, the, from, the, from the fund, after the Battery Park City Authority pays its own um, operations expenses and the debt service. So, what we're asking for with this resolution is to say, Bucket, the, the buckets, the targets have been met. We need to come up with a new joint purpose fund needs, new, like a need statement, a, a new targets, right? We would like to have residents of Battery Park City being given a seat at the table with the mayor, the comptroller, and the BPCA when these decisions are, are being made. We want to have a seat in how, they're, how it's spent. Um, and we want to be included in the discussions, negotiations, and the designations of how it comes out. And I'm calling it the 2022 amendment because I'm going to assume they're going to do it in 2022, but that's just me, you know, coming up with a number because it's up to them what they do. At this point in time, they do what they want and it could sit for 10 years before they make a decision and the money just collects. Uh, Lucian, if you go to the next page, they can, people can see the last, 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 or is there another? Yeah, there we go. So what we're asking for, this is my suggestion, but I'm open to um, input. Um, we're asking for the CB1 to have the mayor and comptroller and BPCA to include at least one member of Manhattan Community Board 1, at least one of the four district leaders, perhaps, representing Battery Park City, because you've got a district leader, man and woman, and that covers South Battery Park City and, one the, and the two that cover the North. That's a thought I had just to kind of make it a little bit more diverse. And then someone whose primary residence is in Battery Park City, in no income requirement, no uh, renter or or um, owner requirement, just a resident. And that's my suggestion. I throw it out to you guys. Oh, and I'm asking, we ask for uh, committed transparency because no matter what, we need to be transparent. Jeff, I'm going to call on you first. Um, I my begging to this committee is that we pass something on this because it's urgent that we weigh in on it. Now let's talk about what we want to pass. Go ahead, Jeff. Um, a couple of comments. Uh, one is I'm assuming the, the 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 description of all of this stuff is accurate. Nick has made any number of presentations to yeah. us, uh, and uh, there's a lot of information uh, that, that he's provided to us. This sounds to me roughly consistent with what he's described, but I hope somebody's checked that just to make sure that it's yeah. uh, accurate. I uh, have gone crazy doing it, but I am open to suggestions. Okay. Nick, if you see something wrong there, that would be worth correcting. Um, and okay, you know, thank you. A second comment that I would make is that in many of you who've heard Nick make these presentations, um, the authority through Nick has has essentially invited us to stand up and say, you know, uh, do we want to be involved in these discussions? And if we do, we should say so. Um, and uh, you know, they don't necessarily have the power. To say yes or no to it, but this is not something in, in uh, that's antagonistic to the authority. It's something that's really responsive um, to 
uh, it's something that we want, and it's something that's also responsive to suggestions that they've made. Um, in terms of the resolution itself, I don't think we should be designating district leaders. Remember, those aren't public officials. They are political party officials. Oh, okay. You imply you want the ones you refer to happen to be Democratic Party um, officials. Uh, uh, so if we're going to ask for Democratic Party officials, we that's not ask. fair. Good point. Yeah, so, so I don't, that. I don't think we should be. A, you know, it's not a political exercise, so we shouldn't be yeah, asking. Mix that. That's I mean, funny. I mean, at, at least at, at least one of the four people agree a hundred percent. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. some um, of them may or may not be residents of the of of, of the authority. I mean, of the of Gallery Gallery Park City, and, not, and, yeah. and they may or may not be appropriate members as as residents but i don't think we should designate district leaders okay so i would agree. other than that i don't have anything to particularly uh add to it i think i think we should have a small representation similar to what you've described there i think someone from the community board and at least other and one other at least one other uh, resident of of uh, battery park city it sounds uh, good to me i mean I, i'm open to other suggestions it sounds good to me yeah i accept that solution just to grace number two I'm good with that. And anybody else have something to add? If not, call the question. I, I don't see the community saying much of anything. If we're all good, let's just call the question and move forward. Thank you. Call the question. That's easy and fast for our right, other here questions. we go. We'll just do this fast. Kucha. Yes. Gasell. Not here. Flores. You have to unmute um, Eric. Yeah. Sorry, floor is yes. Callaway. Callaway, yes. Okay. Okay, uh, abstain. Schneck. Schneck, yes. Song. Song, yes. Weinstock. Stock, yes. Forest. Yes. Okay, the ayes have it, the motion carries. Back to you, Justine. I'm on mute. Um, Nick, I, I, thank you for doing this. I'm, I, I want to punt the discussion basically in the description to Eric and, and Nick. They approached me before the meeting to ask me what I thought about it and what was going on. And I think it makes sense. I am hopeful that the community board and the members of the public that are here can give them some direction and some ideas if they have any suggestions. But as it, at the end of the day, I think it's a sensible thing to do, and I think that what you have guys had needed us to do is come up with a resolution or um, at least give you the thumbs up or thumbs down, right? And then you're going to do what you do, need to do, but you're willing to listen to us. So go ahead, Nick, with that, you're in charge. Right, and thank you. Uh, thank you for that, and I will uh, make it brief and turn it over to the real expert, my my associate and colleague, uh, Eric Munson. And Justine, just to say kudos for you to getting through, getting through so much of the agenda so quickly. I thought this was going to be in an 11 o'clock evening, and it may yet it still, is, but not because of us. Don't say that. Do not, not say that. Not, not because so. of us. Um, in any event, yes, and Justine, and yeah. thank you. So, right, night is young. We reached out to Lucian and Justine. So, along the short of it here, just to kind of to set the stage is, as you all know, and as we talk about um, often, if not always, um, is our suite of uh, resiliency infrastructure initiatives that we are now in the process uh, of uh, executing across Battery Park City, the Battery Park City Ball Fields and Community Center Resiliency Project, the South Battery Park City Resiliency Project, and the North Battery Park, the Northwest Battery Park City Resiliency Project. Eric will go into it in the uh, in the presentation, but uh, in so doing, there are some ancillary effects that we want to be able to um, continue to get. Public feedback on, and one of those is uh, is uh, some impacts to public art, and we know how important it is generally to the community, 
and how much in the DNA of uh, Battery Park City and the Battery Park City Authority itself public art is given uh, our master plan and how much care and attention we give to our public art in maintaining it and cultivating it uh, and inviting new temporary uh, temporary installations in that help make this neighborhood what it is. So with that, that's kind of my uh, my entree. I will turn it over to our chief operating officer, Eric Munson. Eric. Thanks, Nick. Um, I'm Eric Munson. I'm chief operating officer at the authority and in that role, I have the privilege of working with our team on the stewardship of our world class public art collection. When I say world class, I'm not exaggerating. The artists who brought the pieces to Battery Park City over the past 36 odd years, whether it's Louise Bourgeois or Martin Purrier and others, they're truly internationally recognized and at the board's urging a few years back, and as part of our strategic plan, the 2019 Resilience Action Plan that we worked on together, our team has doubled down on the stewardship of the collection, which is valued in excess of $63.5 million. We have a robust semi-annual cleaning of the collection now. We've executed capital projects to restore elements of the pieces that have suffered from wear and tear that's commensurate with out, outdoor sculpture on the waterfront. And we've developed a pipeline of new temporary public art installations that transform public space and encourage social cohesion and promote awareness about cultural and civic challenges. And in that vein, to Nick's point, I'm presenting today regarding an issue that our team has been grappling with over recent months. As the committee knows, we're on the verge of issuing requests for proposals for the construction of the South Battery Park City Resiliency Project a project that we've been working with you all on over the past four years. And Nick tells me, he told me earlier today that this is the 12th time that we've been presenting on an issue related to the South Resiliency Project for this committee. Lucian, I think you have a presentation that Nick sent over. If you could throw it up on the screen, we can walk through it together and I promise we'll make this brief. Um, are you with me there, Lucian? Otherwise I can share it, got it. Should I do that? Oh, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. And we can now go to the next slide. <laughs> Thanks, so these are the three resiliency projects which you know and love the ball fuel resiliency project we're very close to having wrapped i don't want to steal any thunder but really excited about news there and the middle one that i'll be speaking with you about today is the south resiliency project there are three pieces of public art which you'll read about on the next slide which we can go to if you'd like lucian um ape and cat at the dance by jim dine eyes by louise bourgeois and resonating bodies by Tony Craig. And together, again, this is not about dollars and cents. This is about the value that these pieces add to our community, but they're you know, valued in well in excess of $6 million and our stewardship of them is really, really important. Um, this is really a question about salvage. When we um, fence off the site for the South Resiliency Project construction, um, you know, the the area will, will be salvaging much of the materials in the area, but, and some of it will be disposed of for these three pieces, you know, the initial thought typically for construction firms is to put the pieces in storage. And, you know, it's our opinion that to the extent possible, you know, these public assets should remain in public view. Um, regardless as to the work that's going on in this for the South Resiliency Project. And so our hope in presenting to you folks some options for where we can locate the pieces is on a temporary basis, just while construction is happening, to relocate the pieces still within the Battery Park City community and then return them back to Wagner Park upon the completion of the construction work. So again, just in terms of general timeline, we're really talking about mid next year would be when we would relocate them for a couple of years. Lucian, can you move to the next slide? This is this goes back to the um, content that Nick was sharing before. You know, this really gets to our strategic plan and the work that we 
did to develop that document and the mandate from our board to make sure that we're being good stewards of these assets. It's not just about the tremendous value that the public art has, but it's really about how they transform our public space, how they encourage social cohesion and promote awareness about cultural and civic challenges. You can read um, Michelle Bogart's really terrific book, Sculpture in Gotham, which speaks to the founding of Battery Park City and in its development, the idea that public art plays a central role in the development of the community, not just in terms of planning where buildings are going, residential, commercial, and otherwise, and how parks will be developed, but really the core role that public art plays in the development of a community. It's important to note that you know some people pay loads of money to go to sculpture gardens all over the country, upstate, elsewhere. Battery Park City Authority's public art is open 24-7, 365, free and accessible to all. And the pipeline of temporary public art pieces that we're working on similarly uh, seek to meet these same goals. Lucian, if you could go to the next slide, please. We had some, oh, you skipped one. We had some goals that we were um, trying to meet when coming up with some new locations. Again, keeping the pieces accessible to everyone, which is to say not put them in storage, not move them off site. Um, to temporarily re relocate, relocate these pieces only once. Um, as I mentioned before, we have the North and West Resiliency Project coming up as well. And so the idea of moving the pieces, um, say for instance, to Stuyvesant Plaza only to need to relocate them again when the construction begins for the North and West Resiliency Project would not be wise. To try to maintain existing park usage. So I know that this has been a discussion point um, for quite some time now, but the idea that we wanna cite these pieces in locations where there's minimal, if any, active recreation so that people can enjoy it just as they would in a sculpture park. Um, and also to maintain the original intent of the artist. So for instance, with Ape and Cat at the Dance, it was uh, artist Jim Dine's intention all, always from the beginning that you would sort of happen upon it. And for those who walk in Wagner Park, it always sort of comes out of nowhere when you're walking down the Esplanade. And then the last one here is minimizing community and operational impact. The idea is that this is a temporary move. And so not only do we um, not want there to be uh, you know, a significant impact on the community in moving these pieces, but we also don't want it to be tremendously costly. We don't want there to be an impact on underground utilities. We want it to be a relatively straightforward process to relocate it. And I should add just for the public's awareness, um, the eyes and resonating bodies, the sort of larger pieces do have substantial footings or sort of posts that have the pieces anchored to the ground. And so, again, we can't sort of, uh, there are, as we know, limited places where we can cite additional public art in Battery Park City. Um, and these uh, pieces, again, they just, they have few, but real operational needs that we need to meet. And so in that vein for, and Lucian, you can go to the next slide here, the idea for temporary locations for Ape and Cat at the dance and for Eyes were one each in uh, the Rector Parks. The idea is that there's some hardscaping um, on the Eastern side of Rector Park East where we could simply relocate Ape and Cat at the dance. These locations are not exact, but they're meant to give you a sense of where they would lo be located. Also, the technological challenges of making them to scale is also beyond me. So these are, again, general locations, but the idea would be that the, the hardscape in Rector Park East would uh, accommodate Ape and Cat at the dance. There's a, uh, it's our understanding that there's a requirement for eyes that it needs to be within view or vice versa of the Hudson. And so the idea behind eyes would be, it would be on Rector Park West. And again, on the far end of Rector Park West, but that would be located temporarily in lawn space. And so again, it's, I think it's an eight foot by four foot um, space or thereabouts where eyes would be located again on a temporary basis. Again, the idea here is that Rector's Park, Rector Park's existing usage is passive recreation. The idea that 
um, folks can have a contemplative moment there now and with the art here, um, again, on a temporary basis, they could continue to have those contemplative moments only with world-class sculpture in their midst. The last piece is resonating bodies and the idea to relocate that piece was to move it to the, Lucian, you can go to the next slide for the uh, rendering there, to the, um, the median in North End Avenue across from Stuyvesant High School. Um, again, there's some hardscape benches around the median, but the idea would be that these pieces too would be located um, on the lawn in that space, which is typically used for uh, passive recreation or for active recreation by really little kids. And so the idea would be um, that to the extent that folks still want to have that playtime with toddlers and three and four year olds that they could still have it among world class sculpture. The other thing that we sort of liked about the idea of locating these pieces here is that um, it's directly across from from Brookdale. And so it would give um, folks who are typically uh, have a harder time getting around the neighborhood, some access to some world-class sculpture right out their window. And also for what it's worth, the Stuyvesant kids who have lunch um, on that median. So those are the locations that we had proposed um, and that we're proposing here. Again, we're trying to avoid the, um, the possibility of storing the pieces. If we're unable to find locations that work, I think storage is, a, again, a temporary solution that we can avail ourselves of, but the overall um, idea here is that we can have the pieces stay in situ when there's colossal construction work taking place um, in Wagner Park in the years ahead. So with that, I'd be happen to, happy to answer any questions you have or take your feedback. So I see, um, thank you, first of all, Eric. Um, I, I appreciate, before I list it up to the com committee, um, I appreciate your coming to us to present these ideas and these suggestions. I appreciate the thought that went into the process of picking the locations. Um, as you guys give feedback, and I'm hoping that the community members will also give feedback, um, there's a timeline here. You had presented that to me. You, you kind of need us to, to decide tonight and, and to give you feedback onto the space or say, if we really hate it and everybody's screaming and yelling and freaking out, you'll put it in storage, which doesn't seem like the most optimal of choices, but I wish there were more than six people from the community, community online uh, to weigh in on this. But anyway, I'm closing this over and, and asking Bob Schneck to go first and I'll, then I'm gonna look and see who else's hand is raised up. Yeah, and Justine, if I could just, but before Bob goes, if I could just add with, with context with regards to the timing, again, the idea isn't to pressure the community or to rush you folks so much as it is if we um, are looking, either whether we're looking to move it on site or whether to move it into storage, there's just a procurement timeline that we're sort of up against as well mm -hmm. as the time that it takes to conduct the work. And so again, it, the idea here isn't to rush you folks so much as it is we need to make sure that we have a clear scope of work so that we can get a competitive bidding process to do the work. And you don't hold up the start of the resiliency because we kind of need Exactly, that to... right. Yeah. No, so th it's, it's logical. All right, so now let's see what people have to say. Thank you. All Go right. ahead, yeah. Bob, then Jeff. Okay, so I, I just wanted to ask the question. Um, these are being moved because they're in harm's way because of the construction that we're gonna have along uh, the Hudson. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. And so really it would cost, if you're going to move, you have to move them anyway. And it will, and right. just to lift them up, it actually is, is easier and cheaper to uh, lift them up and store them on our own, own land than it is to put them into a, put them into any kind of storage, which would be a significant additional cost, I can imagine. Yeah, I think the big question mark is whether there's anything underground in terms of relocating them on site. Right, so I think Bob, what you said is accurate. Provided, um, provided we wouldn't be do it, you know, we wouldn't have to move any utilities, say for instance, which again isn't really in the cards for us. And so, provided it's, you know, there's um, nothing underground and we can simply relocate them within Battery Park City, um, then our expectation is that it would be cost effective to keep them on site. And again, the benefits are far 
far go far beyond the monetary value of this. I just wanted to say, just as a general comment, that I've one of the reasons I moved in here is because I was an admirer of, of all the remarkable art there is here, and it really shows uh, what a sensitive eye can for art can actually do for a community. And just at the base of Rector Place, where I live, you just go that just that just that kind of weather style sculpture uh, is just a wonderful monument to any community. So I think we're we are remarkably blessed to have had the uh, founders of Battery Park City so oriented toward art. Agreed. I think you're referring to R.M. Fisher's Rector Gate there. Absolutely right. And so yeah. that's just one of the things. So I just have a, a little series of questions about protecting those. For example, what happens to Mother Cabrini? <laughs> what happens to the upper room? What happens to the Belvedere? What what happens to those rem remarkable sculptures by Otterley and Rockefeller Park? Uh, and uh, I, all that needs some kind of protection if we're going to have some major renovations. So are we going to protect all of them? And is it even possible? Yeah, so those are outside the scope of the South Resiliency Project. But I can tell you that the collection is near and dear to our heart and that it's a priority of of you know maintaining it and being good stewards of it, and so I think that that work will um, be investigated when we look at the sort of meets and bounds of the North and West Resiliency Project, um, which is you know the the work is beginning now in earnest for for design, um, but I I don't have an answer for you as to what exactly is going to happen to each of those pieces just yet. Thanks so much. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. So then Jeff, then Robin. Um, I, I, I think the suggestions are good ones. Um, uh, I, while we were um, looking at the screen of, of your slides, I actually pulled up Google Maps with the satellite view to try to get a better idea of the scale. And I, and I think um, you were correct that you're not very good with scale. <laughs> you're, your sculpture things um, are make it appear like they will be much larger in these locations than they actually will be. They they are considerably s smaller in scale uh, than your little diagram. So, for example, looking at the ones that um, are on the screen right now, the um, resonating bodies uh, up uh, in the placement up by Stuyvesant, um, they would not n be nearly that big uh, in. Um, uh, in in that space and in, in scale, at least according to the pictures I'm looking at on on Google Maps, which I think uh, just a long way of saying they they won't be as disruptive of whatever the ordinary uses are as might be implied um, uh, by the scale of uh, of these diagram these slides. Um, but I would ask, and 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 perhaps this is your objective already, is that to the maximum extent possible minimize the footprint of these uh, pieces in their temporary spots so that w whatever is taken away from its current use is 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 as small as can be. And I, I think given these locations, which I'm familiar with all of them, it'll probably enhance the experience rather than the other way around. But I think it is important to, to minimize the physical impact. That's my only comment. Jeff, if I could just clarify, what you're saying is, for instance, with resonating bodies, since there are two pieces to keep them together. Oh no, 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 no. The, whatever uh, the the location of either piece. I mean, you're, for example, uh, you 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 have a little square around them uh, uh, in in your little diagram here. Um, you know, they sit on a particular piece of real estate. Don't expand that piece of real estate beyond what is necessary to hold the individual piece. I, I'm, I'm not expressing a view one way or the other of whether those pieces should be close together or far apart. I think they are right. intended to resonate, so to speak, with one another. So presumably they will have some distance, but, yeah, it makes but, sense. I, yeah. but I'm not suggesting to minimize uh, their, their separation. Thanks for clarifying. Sorry, I just, just wanted to make sure the, I understood. Yeah. Right in front of the, of the hallmark, right? That's where this is? Brookfield, Brookdale. That's right. Across from Brookdale, yes. Yeah. 
And that right now is just a grassy area. It's not the dog run. That's correct. Okay. The dog run is in the median south of it. Got it. No, yeah, I'm just look, trying to get place it. Thank you. Um, I think uh, Judith is. Robin. Robin. <laughs> um, I I think it's uh, first of all, I think it's great that uh, the art is moving to a new neighborhood in our community and giving, you know, like everything is local, right? So. I mean, it'll give people in that neighborhood in the North neighborhood a chance to see what's typically not in their neighborhood. Um, and I appreciate the comment you made about assuming there are no underground interferences with the setting of the sculptures on any parcel. Um, because that would be a much larger cost uh, item and much more disruptive. Um, if you do encounter um utilities or whatever underground uh uh assets are there other places that you've thought of and at the risk of sounding terrible maybe that place <clears throat> between the murk and uh the irish hunger memorial as a big grassy area you know if not if these don't work out but i think it's important if you can do it to keep the art alive and active in the community. It's as Rob, uh, as Bob said, you know, it's such an allure of uh, Battery Park City and uh, would be a shame to lose it for a couple of years if it's possible not to. So thank you for sharing this with us. Thanks, Robin. Yeah, I would say as a sort of threshold batter, it's our current operating understanding that the places that we're proposing here don't have anything underneath them. And so we're going to do our thorough due diligence just to make sure that we, as they say, know before we drill. Um, but it's our understanding that it's, you know, going, it's that, that we're in good shape on that front. I wholeheartedly agree with you on the idea of seeing the art in a new light and in a new neighborhood. And I'm excited for the opportunities that that provides. I know Abby Ehrlich, our director of community partnerships and public art, um, who's really on the ground managing this work on a day-to-day -day basis is really enthused about it as well. And, is creatively thinking of new ways to activate the art in its new homes. Um, we've joked about the prospect of like, maybe we'll, you know, maybe in its new location, there's going to be so much love for it that we're not gonna to wanna to move it back. But I think we're, the operating principle right now is that this is a temporary move. And, you know, we have, as you know, spaces that have been identified in the South Resiliency Plan for, the, for these pieces, new homes for them, so. Um, thanks, Robin, for your comments. Yeah, it's kind of like musical chairs, you know. Yeah, right. There you go. That's great. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you, um, Betty. Thanks. Hi, Eric. Um, Hi. It seems like a very well thought out plan, and I certainly agree with reciting things outside within Battery Park City. My one concern is because there are other resiliency projects, and I understand why you haven't gotten to them yet. That's understandable. But how many pieces, it should be known sort of how many pieces have to be moved. I don't want to end up such as on the strips where these are going. They end up just being chock-a-block with statues and things that have been replaced in other locations. Uh, also to potentially get rid of things that we like even more because the space is already taken. So if I had a little bit of a sense of South Battery Park City could accept some of these pieces back on a rolling basis, so that, in fact, they wouldn't all be in play at the same time at any point in time. Yeah, so that's it's, my concern. Got it. Yeah, it's our expectation that we'll be moving these pieces um, before the work begins on the North and West project. And so I don't think that we'll be, I think that the musical chairs game, well, I think the time, I, I'm not saying this. Nick is the better communicator between the two of us. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I think we're, in, uh, we're Eric, thinking true. it through so that we're not, um, again, cramming art into the wrong places. The other thing that I just wanted to mention, one of the really cool things about our collection of public art is how how diverse it is in what it is. So, you know, it's we can't necessarily pick up as Mr. Smythe has told us numerous times, you can't pick up the upper room and plop it into Rector Park, for example, or put it on the, you know, the Murray Street Triangle, for example. And similarly with South Cove, which is a piece of public art, we can't 
move that so easily either. And so I think for these um, sort of discrete sculptures, it's a more straightforward exercise, but I think, you know, both to your and to Jeff's point, we're going to need to grapple with these issues in the months ahead with regards to the, the collection more broadly. But as of now, we don't have any plans to move any of the other pieces. Excellent. Um, I think that everybody has spoken and I don't see anybody from the attendee list weighing in. So um, I think we're good. And I think you probably got your seal of approval, Eric. <laughs> Thanks. I, I haven't heard anything negative. So um, I, am, I, I think, like I said, I think it's a good idea to not put them in storage. I understand what you're doing and it makes sense. And I, yeah, good job. Thank you. Okay. And thank you for Thanks, coming Justine. to us and asking us. So, yeah, thumbs up. Thank you, Justine. You're welcome. This and is great. I mean, if we had to draw it up to go a certain way with getting the community involved at the outset and making sure that we had a well thought out approach and yeah, this this is it. So, um, again, I, I'm yeah. glad that we continue to set the set the standard for uh, engagement together. Uh, Wait, as a group here, you I want to interrupt you before I close it out because I see Barbara Ireland in the um, attendee section has raised. Oh, hey, Barbara. So let's let her speak. But yeah. Which I'm, yes, I, thank I, you. I'm glad. No, I'm happy because I'd like to hear what the community at large has to say. Okay. Barbara, so I would like to have us walk through Rector Park before the artwork is placed or approved. That is an active ground and the two end items on the park as anchors um, do have a lot of public action of sitting space. So I would like us as a committee to look at those two rector, let's say bookend parks before the art is installed there. Can we do that, Eric, and have a like, a, I mean, because question one for you is, um, so your idea was to put them not on the grass, but to put them on the edges, right? So for the for eyes, it would be on the grass, the far western part of the grass, and on the eastern, for, sorry, for ape and cat at the dance, it would go between the two trees um, in Rector Park East on the hardscape. On the hardscape. Okay, so and so, so okay. with that, so, is yes, there Re Rector Park. West is a very active green space. It's so active that the grass can barely grow there. So we cannot, in my mind, put a piece of art there. Is there a way to put it not on the grass? Or, I mean. No, the, when we looked at the Rector Park, Rector Park West areas, we wanted to make sure that we preserved the, there's a really old crab apple tree that's. There is there and so we're trying to again preserve the trees and the to the extent possible the green space mm -hmm. um you know we have in speaking with the parks operations folks who were who walked both of those all three of those sites i should say earlier today um we talked about the prospect of perhaps putting um both of the pieces on the hardscape in rector park east and thought that it would be too, too crammed. And also, again, there's the, the artist's wishes to have it sort of speak with the, the Hudson Estuary. So the idea was, again, with the, the thought was that even though it is, Rector Park is heavily used, the idea is that it is not designed to be active recreation space. And the wayfinding signage that we have there and our website all indicate that it's for passive recreation use only. And so the hope was that Again, it was though, though it's used that folks could sit and enjoy the park among the sculptures and that they wouldn't be quote unquote in the way. So, now Barbara, so I strongly disagree with the location because of the trees. It's 50% um, shade and therefore there's not that much uh, available space all the time. And we're talking about years of use. So I would like to recommend that the committee comes back to you for a new location for the both both the rector east and west. Do we have a walkthrough, Eric, or could we do something at least to give some 
input um, because yeah, I would be, I'd be happy to walk the space with you folks. Is it possible that we can do it this week to keep to the timeline that we discussed? I think that would be something um, I if we could just like offline text or something just and pick up some some times I have to look at work. I, I don't I, I guess Barbara my my answer back is I'm I was surprised more people didn't speak up just to question them. How the use was and whether it was grass, not grass. My understanding of the way the Rector Park West is used is you've got little kids that will play ball, they run. It, it's never a big game. You're not playing a, you're not playing soccer there. You're not playing tennis there. You're not playing. No, we're not. Know. We're they're picnicking, they're having birthday parties, they're laying out in the lawn chairs and stuff um, like that. Et cetera, but it's a very busy park. It is a busy park, and that's why the walkthrough might be helpful because with the eyes, they're not that big. I mean, they're big, but they're not that big. So I don't know that that would interfere with any of those activities, which is why. When the, size, the, I reckon the, it was eyes by eight. Not, the eyes don't even see the river, so I don't see the correlation. Yeah, it was, no, I, it was I, four, four by eight was the size, Eric. I'm sorry. I'd like to double check. Okay, it's okay. it's in that vicinity. Yeah. So Barbara, let's um. Nick, can you just like sort of try to set something up and we can do a walkthrough? And I see Bob Schniff there. Yeah, um, for sure. We'll connect right. offline and we'll get some but time scheduled if we can this week. If other people, can I, can I just, people who live there. Second, Justine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think a tour is a good idea, but I, I don't know for the little kids who seem to populate that area. It's going to be Bob. Their families. Not. I think it's a lovely amenity for them to have public art right where they're playing. So. I, I wouldn't object to it unless it took up a huge amount of real estate, which I don't think it does. So that's, that's my two cents on it. Yeah. Having kids who grew up and played in that park. I, I would agree with you because again, having kids that, that play there and I, you know, see kids that play there. I, I think that the use would be, they just play around it and yeah. people can still use it. So I, I don't see it as, as, as um, prohibitive. Um, I don't, you can see, I don't and you can see parents saying to their children, okay, run up to the statue. Yeah, right. Exactly. And things like that. So, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's a real um, cultural enhancement for yeah. children in the community. So anyway, that said, my I also, yeah, no, I appreciate it. And Barbara, but, but I want to give Barbara um, uh, voice, right? I want her voice to be heard on it. And, and if we could do a walkthrough with the idea that if, 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 you know, to me, if the option is putting it in storage or having it potentially ruined or putting it there, I, I say put it there. But, um, I, I, you know, we can look and see and let's get a sense of the scale of it. And then, Bob, is your hand raised to speak? Yes. And Barbara, before you speak, thank you for re re for speaking because I really thought more people would weigh in. How's that? Or question at least. So, go ahead, Bob. So I I have uh, lived on the fourth floor, exactly above uh, Rector Park East, and I've witnessed the kids playing in it for all those years. And I think that this is a, a terrific public amenity for them, and it's an opera that art. I really believe that art matters, and that a chance for kids to interact with art and see it up close like that is a really terrific value. And my reference point is having visited the Alice in Wonderland in Central Park. It's wonderful to see kids interacting with that. And I don't know what the rules are about slapping people down on it, but I kind of admire um, the reality of, uh, of bronze and the way it changes when people touch it. And I think I'm much more of a fan of touched art that, that people and particularly kids can interact with. So I like the idea of art up close and i really when kids run they kind of run around on the outside uh of the of the park if they're racing each other and there's enough space for them to play the kind of games that justine described so i think it's a i think it's a wonderful solution and a wonderful social experiment to put things like that in a park up close and personal i yield <laughs> I took the liberty of sharing a photo that Abby Ehrlich sent me earlier today on of of eyes, and that's in what, the that's eyes what, in the wild, eyes in the wilds, right? There you go. But that that's what I expect will happen at Rector Park too. So so 
again, I'm giving, I appreciate Barbara attending the meetings and, and, and having her having a voice and be, and I want her to be heard. So if we could do the walkthrough the next day or so, whatever. Um, but then majority kind of is in favor again at the, with the consideration that the other option is, um, storage. All right, Barbara. So Nick, you'll reach out to, to us, right? And make sure you include Barbara. <coughs> reach out to us. Yes, of Lucia. course. Yes, of yeah. course. I'll get you some times and uh, let's see if we can't get find some time either uh you know as soon as either tomorrow afternoon or sometime on Friday. That would be perfect. Um but yes, for sure. And Eric, thank you. And Justine, yeah, and thank you so thank much you for the guys. time for the committee this evening. Yep. Thank you. And Barbara, thank you again. I really appreciate it. All right, Nick, you take off or I guess let's go. Patrick first, and then you, or is that what we're up to now? Please. Let Pat go. Let poor guy. Let Pat go. Exactly. I know. Pat, back in the good old days when I used to say I'd let you go first, I it's not because I don't want to. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. I used to work in a museum once upon a time. <laughs> so uh, you'll see in uh, Nick's report, mine on the bottom, that uh, shows that. For this year, we had an increase dealing with graffiti, which we spoke about on the last meeting. So we had uh, 20 reports on that. Homeless people, we interacted with four. Lost and found, we had two. The park rules, uh, pretty much the same as last year, 33 reports. Uh, vendor solicitation, we had one. And that was dealing with the vendor food truck that decided to put itself in front of Stuyvesant High School. Uh, and then with dogs, uh, we had 30 reports uh, this time for this month, uh, while last year we had 10. Of course, last year we were in the middle of a pandemic. A pandemic. So uh, that's where we're at. Uh, we did issue summonses this month. We issued summonses in Rockefeller in Wagner Park and in West Thames Park. Anybody have questions? And uh, Pat, those were those were submissions <coughs> for violations of uh, dog rules, right? Uh, yes, dogs off leash. I'm off leash and there's a lot of them and I fear as if I've made contributed to some of those complaints. Justine. I know, right? I just, I have seen dogs, I'm saying this in public records so people know it's me who complained, but I see them having their dogs run in the basketball court and on- uh, You're not gonna see him. He came from uh, the other side of the West Side Highway. He had two dogs. He's the one that got the summons. Okay, that, and- yeah. uh, You'll also see, thanks to uh, Battery Park City's maintenance, uh, all the signs are up showing uh, dogs, you know, where dogs are not allowed, dog free park. Yeah. So they're all prominently posted all around. And now with the uh, season change, you know, it's going into winter, uh, the gates, the fences are slowly going up and around, so the parks are going to be fenced off the lawns. So that they can recover. During the winter. Now that makes sense. Thank you and and thank you for getting the signs up. That's great. And, um, yes, my husband's listening to me. I am not a dog offender. With the dogs <laughs> and the thing. I'm a dog complainer or a complainer about the dogs off leash. So. Just for the record, to be clear. But I know you. you're a dog lover. I'm a dog. I know my husband's a dog lover, but I do have two puppies who are very annoying. Um, all right, Bob, I hope your hand's not raised because I want to move on to Nick. So, oh, look at that sweet baby with that sweet baby right there. You get to go, Nick. Um, Patrick, thank you so much. I don't see any hands raised. I think, Bob, your hands is just so raised. Big. Uh, so big. I know. I know. So adorable. Oh, and she loves you gotta her go daddy. Sleep. You gotta go to sleep. You gotta go to sleep. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Night, baby. Oh. Night, big girl. Okay. That's right. And you're almost done. You can go read That's her a right. book. 
faster hey, Joy, you go, the faster you may, we, we actually may be able to do it. She's up later than she should be. So we're going to do it. Justine, again, <laughs> this is pretty good considering how packed the agenda was. Yeah. No. Bring us home. Um, I warned you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. See, I right. didn't want to get ahead of myself, but right, you know, Rob kept me in check. Um, okay, resolution and thank you. Yes, if you could, um, or just go to the top of my report, be great, and I'll run through it um, with uh, all due, uh, all deliberate speed here. So, uh, just scrolling down, it's a beautiful shot of uh, the area of uh, Southern Esplanade and uh, South Cove, right behind the Museum of Jewish Heritage. Going down here to the report, just so we have it. Uh, again, reminder to for those of you who uh, haven't yet or have your appointments, please continue to get vaccinated and get boosted. All the information there, I've tried to shorten it a bit from prior months, but again, uh, as you know, now all individuals over the age of five are eligible to receive the vaccine for free. Any number of places you can get it. And to the extent that you can get boosted, please go ahead uh, and make your appointment. I will have you know as a as a personal anecdote because I was curious enough to see how well government worked for me, and I say this as a lifelong government employee, I went to vaccines.gov to make an appointment, uh, and it really was very, very simple. You clicked in, you put your zip code in, it gives you a range of locations right by your home where you can then choose any number of appointments to get boosted. So please continue to do so. It's our best way um, out of the pandemic, which we uh, hopefully and thankfully continue to, to beat back. Um, as we scroll down there, we have some COVID statistics uh, locally. We are um, just in line with around where the citywide rate is, which is about two and a half percent over the past seven days or so, uh, but hopefully trending down. There was a, a note in the news the other day that New York City, I think, had gone two straight days for the first time in a while without a COVID related death, thankfully. And that was due primarily to the very high vaccination rate, which is now over 90%. Uh, in New York City. So, uh, heading into the holiday season, obviously, there's a picture of the North South Pole, which every night from now through December 6th is being lit with a candle to uh, uh, to commemorate Hanukkah, of course. Tomorrow evening is the Battery Park City Annual Holiday Classic Holiday Lights in South Cove at 6 p.m. So, come please for music and snacks. The Harlem, uh, Sing Harlem Choir, Choir and PSI is 276 will be uh, singing along with a special guest appearance by you know who. Um, and then obviously, as we celebrate the holiday season, let's keep in mind those who are not as fortunate. There is the holiday gift drop off that's through December 2nd. Uh, and then you can also do it uh, at holiday lights. You can drop off a gift that you'd like to donate and the holiday food drive scrolling further down Lucian runs through December uh, 31st. It's a virtual program, but you can make a can make a donation to help uh, the less fortunate. You can click on the link right there uh, and do so. Nick, speaking can I, of can donation, I come in a sec? Uh, are you talking about ahead. stockings with care? Stockings with care, yeah. Stockings yep. with care drive. Yes, there's two. So the stockings with care is right above it. That's the that's the gift drop. Oh, off. okay. Yeah, I didn't I didn't see. Yeah. Okay. I'm yep. any then, questions please. I can answer. Goodbye. <laughs> no, no, no. Completely okay. Thank you, Robin. And then the. And thank you. I know uh, some folks locally are involved with stockings with care as well. I'm, you know, I know they're they're modest enough, but uh, they do wonderful work. So it's a great organization, and we're very lucky to partner with them for some years now. Uh, City Harvest is the food drive, and then the blood drive. Our holiday uh, holiday blood drive is coming up on December eighth, and that's at that's at Six River Terrace from twelve to six. And uh, over the course of the past year, we've gotten about four hundred or so donations from the from the Battery Park City community. So. So thank you again for being so generous uh, with your time and your donations. Okay, uh, very quick sneak peek. Uh, going down to the next page is the Winter 2022 event guide. That's going to have some classics and some new uh, favorites for the months of January and February. And I don't want to give too much away, but rumor has it that if you come to Holiday Lights tomorrow night, you may also be able to get your hands on a hard copy of the Winter 2022 calendar. So. Another reason to come to holiday lights and celebrate the end of another year with uh, the battery park city community. Um, the children's tree, um, some months ago, we came to the community board. Actually, I think it was the start of last month. Uh, Justine, another prime example of us reaching out and you welcoming us in. Um, we came to the community board to discuss the planting 
of the Children's Tree at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. You'll see that there at the bottom of page four. On the 17th, that was planted by our great uh, Parks Operations team. You'll see the tree going in there, and it is going to be officially dedicated tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock um, at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. So I know we all are all otherwise uh, working or maybe engaged, but if anyone would like to stop by for that uh, ceremony, uh, PSIS 276 student choir will be singing. Um, we'll have the US uh, ambassador to uh, the United Nations there as well, as well as uh, Jack Clyde and a number of uh, who's the president of the museum and a number of survivors uh, from that camp will be there tomorrow morning. So if anyone would like to attend, please let me know um, and we can get you right into the event. It should be a real special, real special moment. Uh, and thank you again for the community board uh, for having us uh, some months or last month to discuss um, some of the particulars around that, that very special addition to our natural landscape. Okay, um, winter hours at the ball fields uh, start today, so they're closing now at 8 p.m. daily instead of 9 p.m. We all know that, that's that's usual, uh, but just so we're aware of that, hours are now to 8 p.m. and they will be in opening at 9 p.m. again starting um, in April. Okay. Parks happenings, we started this last month and we just added some more again. I don't have to go through every one, uh, but a couple of things I would like to make note of uh, in addition to holiday lights and the watering of the trees and the leaf pickup for composting. One of the things that struck me when I was putting this together is um, protective fencing. And I asked Ryan Torres, our vice president of parks and operations to make sure I had it right. And I said, you know what, I'm gonna bring this up because it really speaks to the care that we take in uh, maintaining our gorgeous public spaces. Their uh, installation of a, a protective salt fencing around the North and Avenue planting beds. And I said, is that what I think it is? And she said, yes, because so much of our planting is in parks, you just don't need to do it. But because the North and Avenue planting beds are directly hard up against uh, the roadbed of North End Avenue, you run the risk of a lot of salt and other debris over the course of a harsh winter getting kicked up into the planting uh, beds and damaging the plants. So there's protective fencing going, going up around that. Uh, so the plantings stay as uh, beautiful and healthy as we all expect them to be. And it really goes to the level of care and attention our parks operations professionals um, commit to keeping Battery Park City what it is. So thank you. I thought that was an interesting note. The Esplanade Volleyball Court, Esplanade Plaza Volleyball Court, as we all know, we had the group come to the community board a couple of months ago. We were happy to make the connection with some of the folks there, and you'll see there at the bottom of page five, we had the last night of the volleyball court for this season, um, uh, middle month. It came out on November 19th because of the cold weather, as it does each year, and it should be put in place again um, on May 1st or <laughs> May 1st or thereabouts as the weather as the weather warms up. Hi, sweetheart. Are you sleeping? Okay. <laughs> okay. Come on. Um, so that's that. Uh, and thank you again for a great season. And there's also uh, an Instagram um, account there if you want to follow along with updates, uh, with updates and how to keep in touch with their pickup games and other events they have going on uh, with the Esplanade Court. Okay, the parks lawns, as we know, are closed uh, for the season. Pat, thanks for that. And you'll see a picture there of actually some of the no pets allowed sign. Uh, that's a picture of it in Rockefeller Park. But again, sometimes it's just about re-educating and reminding folks about the rules and take the opportunity uh, to do so here. So thank you, Pat, for the support, uh, and Eric and Ryan um, for getting these yeah. things back up. Uh, resiliency projects, we touched on a lot this evening, the ones I did want to note, and we just we just calendared it, and you will see um, some additional promotion over the course of the next few weeks, including ads in our fine local publications. We did the workshops for the Northwest Battery Park City Resiliency Project in uh, October and November. And by popular demand, we added one on Saturday, November 13th. You may or may not notice the back of Justine Cuccia, esteemed chair of the Battery Park City Committee there, at the bottom right of that photo. Um, but why I bring it up is because we're going to have the second public meeting. We had the kickoff meeting in August. This is actually a sit down presentation where we go through a slide deck. We did that in August. We're gonna be doing the second one for the Northwest BPC Resiliency Project on uh, Thursday, December 16th. That's two weeks out from tomorrow, but we will be pushing that out uh, via the social channels uh, through the community board if you all can help spread the word and uh, in the, the local publications. Again, it's not scheduled opposite 
um, any uh, directly related community board uh, committee meeting. So we want to make sure we, we did that in the night. That was not in direct conflict. Okay, scrolling down, we can go through the list of uh, a lot of those meetings. The Battery Park City ball fields, as we see, are close to uh, completion at the bottom of page seven. Um, and then the top of page eight, Justine, I know this is something that had come up uh, a month or so ago, but pleased to announce or to uh, remind folks that the Battery Park City ball fields terrace, that's the top of page eight, Lucian, is now reopened after uh, the waterproofing and restoration work. So you will see that at the top of page eight. That is now reopened to the public uh, and ready to go for the seasons to come. I know it's a very popular viewing spot for a lot of folks who like to watch the games going on. Hold on now uh, once. Okay. Okay, scrolling down, Lucian, thank you. Uh, ready BPC, we had our winter preparedness session. Uh, on Monday evening, if you missed it, don't worry. It will be on our YouTube channel shortly. You'll recall we presented this uh, to the committee uh, some months ago. We did the initial presentation in June as kind of an introductory session. We did one the other night on winter preparedness, including information on such topics as how to prepare for a winter storm and extreme cold, snow removal supplies, and how to stay connected. So that uh, will be on our YouTube channel quickly. It actually uh, soon, it, uh, shortly rather. It actually has a lot of useful information and is only about a half hour. So if you have some time as you're running back and forth, you want to uh, click onto it and listen. It has some really useful information from our partners at the New York City Office of Emergency Management. Uh, scrolling through, uh, Lucian, the rest of this stuff is not unimportant, but is also not new news. So the only thing I would draw your attention to, uh, Scrolling down to the bottom of page nine is our last Battery Park City board meeting for the year is Wednesday, December 15th. And the New York Police Department, New York City Police Department, first precinct community council is notably back in person uh, beginning next Thursday. That's Thursday, December 9th at 6 p.m. at the first precinct station house. Bye. That is a great uh, forum for folks who want to uh, discuss. Um, Public safety and other quality of life matters in the neighborhood. And that is uh, next Thursday, again, next Thursday, December 9th at 6 o'clock at the first precinct station house. Uh, and beyond that, no public, uh, no permitted walks or runs scheduled um, for any more of the season. And that's it. Justine, thank you. No, for the very time. good. Um, and you reminded me, I don't know why, and maybe I missed it, but um, I want to make sure everybody knows, and we have on the record, that the connection bus is suspended indefinitely at this point, not for um, lack of funding, how's that, right? But it's, it is not running right now, and um, I've, I've backed behind the scenes, and I'd love to have the, um, the uh, downtown alliance to come in and, and kind of present as to what their plan is to get it back up and running. Because it's cold, a lot of our uh, seniors, as well as people with young children, rely on that bus. It gets to more places um, than the city buses get to. And it's just an easier, simpler way to get around. And a lot of people rely on it. So um, that would be something that I would look to the authority as we get more information to kind of help get this up and kind of pressure the pressure them to get it going. Give us answers as to what's going on and to get it going. Um, and with that said, does anybody have a question? Bob, your hand is still raised. I'm hoping it's not um, that I've ignored you this whole time, but you certainly have the right to speak. So please, if you have something to say. I have a small thing to say, and it's just two pieces. One is about the park lawns. Um, uh, in some of the commentary, people have mentioned that they're bald where they should be grassy. And I've seen these lawns at a quality, uh, at a at a golf club kind of quality in my lifetime here. And we're way away from that now. And I even consider buying some clover and kind of seeding it myself, but I don't think that'd be encouraged. But we really need, at least in the Little Rector Park here, we really lost a lot of grass. And in the past two or three seasons, the skill at replacing it, it hasn't been there. So we need to give it a little more attention if we can. 
And the other thing is something I've mentioned to you lots of times before, and every year it gets a little worse, and that's a re restoration for the Berlin Wall, which is where the uh, where the painting is really starting to crackle away. And so if that's going to be preserved, it has to be soon. Otherwise, it'll just be a blank slate of flat car concrete. So that's my, those are my two comments. But I do want to thank the Battery Park City Authority for doing great work year after year. So I'm still a believer. Thank you. Bob, I can speak to the Berlin Wall section, which is a perennial issue that we are trying to grapple with. Um, the, uh, we're trying to find an appropriate home for it to accompany the restoration work, but we think that the most appropriate home may actually be its existing home and that we might find a way to protect it on site. So that's our current thinking, but we're working with some specialists to make sure that we are taking a sensible approach. Which is great. No, that, that's perfect. Thank you. I agree it. with that. And I just hope it, and where it is, it makes sense. I pass it all the time. It just sad to watch it generate in place too. Thank you. Yep. Yep. I was gonna put you on the spot. So thanks for jumping in since we had you here. I know that is uh, among the many things in your, in your bailiwick. So thank you for that. Okay. And I think with no hands raised that we are good. And I can call this meeting to a close. Do I have a second for that? Second. Thank you so much. And I want to thank you all for your input tonight and your, um, yeah, your information, your input, and your passion for everything that we were talking about. Because it's important and I appreciate all of you. So thank you very much. And thank you. Uh, good night, everybody. Thank you. Justine, good night. Good night. that's bad, Justine. Say again what?